The Appalachian Trail is arguably the most famous footpath in the entire world. Every year, millions of people set foot on it, so this, coupled with its close proximity to major East Coast cities, coupled with its difficult terrain and inclement weather, means it's inevitable for disaster to strike on the trail sometimes. Now let me be clear, the Appalachian Trail is not a death trap. In fact, it's far safer than just about any city street. But regardless of that, the Appalachian Trail has still had its fair share of murders, disappearances, mysteries, and just plain bizarre circumstances. I've covered many of these stories on my channel, and so this is gonna be a marathon compilation of all things Appalachian Trail mystery, but I'm gonna start off by sharing a brand new story, one that has received an alarmingly low amount of attention in the media, a story from the Appalachian Trail that I'm almost positive that you've never heard of. This is the story of Jesse Hoover, which is, to my knowledge, the only unsolved disappearance in Appalachian Trail history. In May of 1983, Jesse Hoover set out for the trip of a lifetime, a thru-hike of the Appalachian Trail. The 54-year-old Texas woman had recently become a widow. Her husband had been suddenly and tragically hit by a car and killed. The couple had been married for 35 years and had five kids together. Jesse was understandably devastated by the loss of her husband, and she began dreaming about through hiking the Appalachian Trail as a way to escape. Jesse's daughter was quoted saying, the thought of doing the AT kind of made her feel good. She had control of that, at least. Hiking the Appalachian Trail is no easy task even today, but in 1983, it was significantly harder. Gear wasn't as good, the trail wasn't as well maintained, and there were far fewer people traveling on it. Jesse Hoover's family was worried about her ability to stay safe on the trail. After all, she was getting older, she was not an experienced hiker, and she suffered from epilepsy. But regardless of her family's concerns, she insisted on going. And so one day in May of 1983, Jesse boarded a Greyhound bus in Fort Worth, Texas, and began the long journey to Northern Maine. For whatever reason, she decided that she would hike the trail southbound. And this is significant for one big reason, that is the 100 mile wilderness. The northern terminus of the Appalachian Trail sits atop Mount Katahdin, which is the highest peak in Maine, by the way, and after reaching its summit, southbound hikers will continue directly into the most remote part of the entire Appalachian Trail. This is known as the 100 Mile Wilderness. As you're gonna hear many times throughout this marathon video, I hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018, so I can personally attest to the fact that the 100 Mile Wilderness is not a good place for an inexperienced solo hiker to be. And to make matters even worse, May is a time of year where this already extremely remote section of trail is gonna be receiving even less foot traffic than normal. On May 20th, 1983, Jesse Hoover entered Baxter State Park keen on climbing Mount Katahdin and starting her journey. However, she encountered some park rangers who ultimately decided that they were not going to allow her to climb the mountain. They made this decision because they felt that she was dangerously unprepared. And this probably should have been a sign that Jesse needed to go home. The park rangers only had jurisdiction in Baxter State Park. And so while they could stop her from climbing the mountain, they could not stop her from hiking into the 100 mile wilderness all by herself. In 1983, hikers had to pass through the A-Ball gatehouse in order to reach the trailhead for the 100 mile wilderness. This gatehouse was on what is called the Golden Road, which is a road that was built by Great Northern Paper Company for logging purposes. One of the attendants at the gatehouse specifically remembered seeing Jesse pass through and not for good reason. Just like the park rangers, this attendant felt that Jesse looked unprepared to be on the Appalachian Trail. 
The attendant even asked Jessie if she was carrying bug spray, to which she replied that she wasn't. And that might seem trivial to some of you, but anyone who's spent time in the Maine woods during black fly season knows how much of a rookie move not carrying bug spray is. Jesse Hoover left the gatehouse and walked towards the 100 mile wilderness. And after this, she was never seen again. It took a tragically long time for anyone to realize that she was missing. Jesse Hoover had made loose plans with her family to call and update them when she could. But nearly two months went by with no calls from her, and finally, on July 11th, her sister reported her missing. Now, it's tempting to criticize the family for waiting so long, but remember, this is the early 80s. Jessie would have had to borrow a phone or use a payphone to call home. It's not like she had an iPhone with her. And her family didn't really understand how often she would have the phone access to do this. The main warden service began searching for Jesse Hoover, but honestly, they weren't confident. At this point, the critical first 48 hours had long since passed. The potential search area was over 15 million acres, and perhaps the most disheartening factor was that the part of the trail that Jesse vanished from had actually just been searched during an unrelated missing hiker case only a few days prior. During that extensive search, which successfully found the hiker they were looking for, no sign of anyone else was found. And for this reason, the wardens never launched a second search after learning that Jesse had gone missing. For the rest of the summer, anyone heading out of the 100 mile wilderness going north on the Appalachian Trail was asked if they'd seen any sign of Jesse. Despite all this questioning, Nobody reported a single sighting of her, her body, or any of her gear. And 40 years later, we still don't have a clue into what happened. We can, however, make some reasonable assumptions. We know that not one, but two witnesses on the last day that she was seen alive attested to the fact that she looked unprepared. We know that she was an inexperienced hiker and we know that she set off into the most remote part of the entire Appalachian Trail during a time of year where it receives very little foot traffic. In a lot of the stories I cover on this channel, there are unanswered questions and things that don't add up, but in this case, absent of any additional evidence I'm not aware of, I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that Jesse Hoover got lost and died in the wilderness as a result. However, that is just an assumption. We'll never know for sure unless her body or gear is recovered. So if you're planning on hiking through the 100 mile wilderness, please keep your eyes peeled. And also, please keep Jesse Hoover in your thoughts. And with that, let's get into our next Appalachian Trail story. Before we get into the rest of the stories, I just want to thank Drink Element for making this video possible in the first place. Whether you're out hiking or even just doing other things that make you sweat, like, I don't know, skiing, walking your dog maybe if it's hot enough, I don't know, you need to be replacing your electrolytes with Drink Element. If you don't replace your electrolytes, you're gonna feel fatigued, your muscles are gonna be cramping up, it's just not healthy and it's not safe. What most people do, and honestly what I used to do, is just run down to the grocery store, pick up whatever stuff is the cheapest, and you don't wanna do that because most of that stuff is full of sugar and full of nonsense that you don't wanna be putting in your body. Drink Element, on the other hand, has no sugar. All it has is a fantastic taste and all the electrolytes that you need to stay hydrated. This flavor right here is citrus salt. This is one of my favorites. They have amazing other flavors too, like raspberry salt, orange salt, anything that fits your palate, I guarantee you that they have it. And you might be like, Kyle, I like chocolate or I like spicy things. How can they have that? They do have that too. Mango chili, chocolate salt, all these flavors that nobody else in the electrolyte game is doing. You really wanna try all these flavors, to be honest, to find what you like the best. And so here's what you can do. Go to drinkelement.com slash kylehateshiking. That's drinklmnt.com slash kylehateshiking. Pick out whatever flavor you think sounds the best to start off with. And when you make a purchase through that link, you're gonna get a sample pack of eight additional flavors, including all the ones I just 
mentioned, thrown in with your order for no extra cost. So you're gonna get to try them all and you can really see what all the hype's about. One more time, drinklmnt.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. Guys, Drink Element has been the longest running sponsor on my channel by far. I cannot thank them enough and I'm honestly proud to be working with such an amazing company. So go try the sample pack if you haven't already. And thank you so much to Drink Element for continuing to support this channel. I think this photo will go down as one of the most disturbing photos in Appalachian Trail history. And that's because just hours after this photo was taken, the hiker in question named Geraldine Largay vanished. For over two years, Geraldine Largay was missing. And this raised a magnitude of questions about what happened to her. But in October of 2015, her body was finally discovered. And though this did answer some of those questions, I believe that even more questions were raised as her final location, her cell phone records, and her personal journal entries became known to the public. It saddens me, it scares me, and honestly it frustrates me because after Geraldine Largay found herself lost just off of the Appalachian Trail, she was so close to receiving the help that she so desperately needed. And yet, that help never came. Let's jump into the tragic story of Geraldine Largay. In 2013, 68 year old retired Air Force nurse Geraldine Largay set out on a through hike of the Appalachian Trail. She started about halfway up the trail near Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, and was planning on doing a flip-flop hike, meaning she was gonna hike north to the end of the trail in Maine, and then go back to Harper's Ferry to hike the second half of the trail southbound. She started her hike with a friend, and the two of them stuck together for a long time, all the way up until New Hampshire, where her friend ended up getting off the trail. In addition to her friend, her husband George was also tagging along, but in a slightly different way. George Largay was essentially acting as a support system for his wife and her friend. He was meeting them at road crossings, he was helping them resupply and bringing them into town. On July 21st, 2013, Geraldine Largay spent the night at Poplar Ridge Lean-To in Western Maine. At this point, she was almost a thousand miles into her hike, which I have to say, it's badass for anyone to hike a thousand miles on any trail under any circumstances. But once again, she was 68 years old and she was hiking through New Hampshire and Maine on the Appalachian Trail. As someone who's hiked the Appalachian Trail the entire thing, that is some of the roughest, most difficult terrain out there and I hope that when I'm 68 years old I'll still have the physical and mental strength she wandered off of the Appalachian Trail to go to the bathroom as all of us backpackers do every single day it's unclear to me what exactly happened next but we know with certainty that Geraldine Largay never returned to the Appalachian Trail and ended up getting lost in the wilderness. It's every backpacker's worst nightmare, and I doubt at the beginning she realized exactly how dire the circumstances were, but she definitely knew that it was not good because shortly thereafter, she sent a text to her husband, George, saying, quote, in some trouble, got off the trail to go to BR, I'm assuming that means bathroom, now lost, can you call AMC to see if a trail maintainer can help me? Somewhere north of Woods Road, XOX. For those of you that don't know, the AMC is a organization that does trail work and trail protection up in the Northeast. Unfortunately for Geraldine, cell coverage is not very good in the deep Maine wilderness and that text message never went through. She repeatedly tried to get her text messages to go through. She even climbed to higher ground to try to get some better signal. And I don't know, dude, I just find it really disturbing because it just seems like she was getting more and more desperate the more she fired off these text messages to her husband. On July 23rd, Geraldine's husband, George, was waiting at Route 27 where he expected to meet his wife for her next resupply stop. But Geraldine never showed up and the next day, George notified the authorities that his wife had gone missing. Very soon after this, a massive search was put together. It was headed by the Maine Warden Service, and I'm saying they really, really went all out. In addition to standard ground searches, they also had helicopters, they had horse teams, they had canine units, and they were even interviewing hikers that were in the area where she disappeared from. But despite this massive search effort, no trace of Geraldine was ever discovered. And as this search was getting underway, she once again tried to send a text to her husband. It read, quote, Lawson, it's unclear to me exactly what happened after this, but 
It is clear that at some point after that text message was sent, she decided that her best option would be to stop looking, to set up camp and stay there and wait for rescue. And that's what she did. She set up her tent and she even set up a silver space blanket a little bit outside of her tent. It's not clear to me exactly what the purpose of this was. It could have been to protect her from the elements, give her a little extra protection. It also could have been to potentially attract the attention of people searching for her. There was also some evidence that she did attempt to start some fires because some of the nearby trees around her were charred black. She did all of this and then she waited and waited and waited. Geraldine Largay waited in this campsite for 26 days. 26 days. 26 days spent waiting for a rescue that never came. And as if that wasn't disturbing enough, it seems that with each passing day, Geraldine Largay became more and more aware that her life was probably coming to an end. And I say this because she kept a journal during her time waiting. She was making daily entries and she even drew out a calendar to try to keep track of which day it was. And I think the most, I don't know, chilling entry from, this is roughly two weeks before she actually died. She wrote, when you find my body, Please call my husband George and my daughter Carrie. It will be the greatest kindness. The last entry was on August 18th, 2013. Investigators do think that it's possible that she lost track of the exact date, so they can't say with certainty that August 18th was that last entry and that was the day that she died. We don't know exactly when she died, but it was likely sometime around that day. But the mystery of what happened to Geraldine Largay continued on well past August of 2013. For the next two years, Hikers were only left to speculate about what happened to her and what caused her disappearance. That is, until... On this day, possible human remains were found by a surveyor on property owned by the U.S. Navy in Reddington Township, Maine, which is very close to the Appalachian Trail. Lieutenant Kevin Adam of the Maine Warden Service was one of the first people to investigate these findings, and he later said, quote, I saw a flattened tent with a green backpack outside of it and a human skull with what I believe to be a sleeping bag around it. I was 99% certain that this was Jerry Largays. Now that her body had been destroyed, discovered, many of the questions surrounding her disappearance had finally been answered. We now knew with certainty that she had simply gotten lost in the woods and then succumbed to the elements and starvation. And while I don't really think there was ever a very strong case suggesting that foul play had been involved in her disappearance, any speculation that did exist about that was now proven to be false. But even though we now had all the answers about what had happened, I still have a lot of questions. These questions are about where she was found, how the search was conducted, and about some of the choices that she made before and after she found herself lost off of the Appalachian Trail. Based off of what I've told you of this story so far, you might think that she would have been found miles and miles and miles deep into the wilderness, far away from any roads, and certainly far away from the Appalachian Trail. But this turned out not to be the case. Geraldine Largay's camp was found less than two miles away from the Appalachian Trail. And of course, she didn't know this, but still, she was right there. Now, I've never been in a situation like this before, and I can't even start to imagine how stressful and scary it must be. And so as I discuss some of the decisions that she made, I just wanna be clear, I'm trying to do this with all respects to her. I'm not saying that she should have done this or shouldn't have done that. This is not about passing judgment on her. All I wanna do is speculate a little bit about how the outcome might have been different had she made some different decisions. And the first question I wanna bring up here is, Given she was found so close to the trail, what would have happened if instead of posting up in camp and waiting for rescue, she had continued to search for her way back? I think that it's entirely plausible that she may have ended up finding the Appalachian Trail again if she had kept looking. And not only was she relatively close to the trail, but Lieutenant Kevin Adam once again also mentioned that there were some other indications of civilization pretty close by to where her camp was set up. He said that in his investigation, he walked 
south from the campsite, which was in a very dense forest. And after doing that, the dense forest became open woods with quote, good visibility after 60 to 70 yards. And he kept walking. And then after another 25 minutes, he found what he described as a clear logging road. And not only that, but apparently this logging road also led to lodging, whatever that means. That's the quote. In total, he said the walk took him 30 minutes. That's how close she was. And so even if she had kept searching and didn't find the Appalachian Trail again, could she have found another trail or a logging road that might have led her to safety? We don't know the answers to those questions I just raised. And honestly, it's easy to say this stuff in hindsight. Once again, I hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018. So I've hiked through this area and I will be the first to tell you the Northern Maine woods are dense. They're very tight and I can easily see how someone could get lost there. Combine that with a lot of stress and anxiety that's just exacerbating the situation and I can easily see why she made the decision to stay put even though again in hindsight we know that she was pretty close to roads and the trail itself. There's another really big question that I'm sure a lot of you are already wondering about given we now know how close her body was discovered to the Appalachian Trail and this big question is how did the search parties and rescuers not find her. They started searching for her on July 24th, and as far as I'm aware, the search wasn't scaled back until August 4th. This means that they were full on searching with dogs, helicopters, and teams on foot for 12 days straight. I just find it really bizarre that she wasn't discovered, especially given she was camping in the area where she was known to have gone missing and therefore would have been the area that they would have been searching. And to be clear, I'm not trying to blame the searchers or the investigators here. I remember when this story happened back in 2013, it was on the news and it was clear that they were doing everything they possibly could to try to bring her home safely. But unfortunately, they just didn't. And it's also crazy because it's not like they didn't come close either. It's since been reported that at least three different canine teams came to about 100 yards away from her camp. Three different times this happened. And again, I'm not trying to blame anybody here, but it does raise the question, how come Geraldine Largay didn't hear or notice the searchers? Now I'm gonna be totally honest, I don't know a damn thing about search and rescue. I'm not gonna pretend like I do. So if anyone in the comments does, maybe you could help me out a little bit here. But with that said, you'd think that the searchers would be making some sort of noise, right? Like wouldn't they be calling out her name? Wouldn't the dogs be barking? If there's a group of people walking around, wouldn't that be causing a commotion in the brush. It just seems like if they got that close, I don't know, like, I, I just, I, I just, it's just crazy to me that they got that close and neither party noticed each other. They had dogs. The dogs must have been following some sort of scent, right? And, and again, I don't know anything about search and rescue, but this just, this part just blows my mind. And once again, Geraldine Largay's final campsite was in a very thick, dense part of the woods. So I guess I can see how they wouldn't have noticed each other via sight. I don't know. It's just sad. Like they were so close and yet all three times neither party was aware just how close they were. Today, through hikers on the Appalachian Trail and many other trails commonly use an app called Far Out for navigation. It's basically a GPS. It shows you your location on and around the trail and it works even when you don't have cell service. But in 2013, Far Out had just been started and the Appalachian Trail was not on the app yet. I'd like to think that in current times, a situation like what happened to Geraldine Lark probably wouldn't happen because all a hiker would have to do is pull out far out and just use the GPS to guide them back towards the trail. It would not matter if they tried to send texts. It would not matter if they had cell service or not. But unfortunately, that wasn't an option for Geraldine Largay back in 2013. But GPS devices did exist then, obviously. And I even found an article that stated she had a GPS. She started with a GPS. And then at some point along her hike, unclear to me where, she lost it. So she didn't have it anymore. She didn't have it at the time where she got off trail. It's tragic, it's frustrating. And to me, it just seems like everything that could have possibly gone wrong in this situation did. My heart goes out to Geraldine Largay and her family. If anything, I hope that other hikers, future through hikers can take something away from this, can learn something from it.
The photo you're looking at right now might not seem like much. It's just a typical thru-hiker smiling, enjoying his time on the trail. And I have no doubt that when this photo was taken, that was exactly what Scott Lilly was experiencing. But on August 12, 2011, Scott Lilly was found dead just off the Appalachian Trail. His death was ruled a homicide, and to this day, nobody has been brought to justice for taking his life. In this video, I wanna tell you guys the story of Scott Lilly. I just feel like people don't know about Scott Lilly's story, and I just can't, for the life of me, figure out why more people aren't talking about this. Now, despite this story, I promise you the Appalachian Trail is still a safe place. Every single year, millions of people hike on it, and to my knowledge, only 13 homicides have ever occurred on or near the trail. Most recently in 2019, thru-hiker Ronald Sanchez Jr. was murdered on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia. And when this happened, his story received a lot of attention from the media as well as among thru-hikers. And rightfully so, it's a super, super sad story. And I still remember when I first found out about it, this was the year after I had completed my thru-hike of the Appalachian Trail, I was, enraged, honestly, and I was really, really scared. And I feel like pretty much everybody in the through hiking community, at least the Appalachian Trail community, know about the story of Ronald Sanchez Jr. Again, as they should. And there's also been a few other high profile murder cases that have happened on or near the Appalachian Trail that a lot of people know about. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about the stories of Julianne Williams and Lolly Winnens. They were murdered in Shenandoah National Park in 1996, just off of the Appalachian Trail. And then I'm sure a lot of you have also heard of the story of murderer Randall Lee Smith who attempted to kill hikers not once but twice also in Virginia. And despite some of these other murders on the Appalachian Trail receiving a lot of attention again from both the media and among hikers, nobody seems to be talking about the murder of Scott Lilly. There's no books written about him. His name doesn't come up when people are talking about safety on the Appalachian Trail. And this is really really bizarre to me because his murder was the second most recent one to occur on the Appalachian Trail trail and also because his case has never been solved. Scott Lilly was from South Bend, Indiana, and he had a huge interest in Civil War history. In fact, his trail name was Stonewall, which I assume is a reference to the Confederate commander Stonewall Jackson from the Civil War. After his murder, his sister Allison was interviewed by a local news station and said, quote, he was a 30 year old man who was living out a dream by traveling the Appalachian Trail and visiting Civil War battlefields. Scott Lilly started his hike on June 15th, 2011 at the Mason-Dixon line, you know, near the Pennsylvania border there, and he was intending on hiking from there south all the way to the end of the Appalachian Trail at Springer Mountain. But that didn't happen because, unfortunately, Scott Lilly was met with foul play. On August 12, 2011, Scott's body was found just off of the Appalachian Trail near Cow Camp Gap in Virginia. Cow Camp Gap is in the west-central part of the state of Virginia, and it's near the Priest, which is a pretty popular mountain on the Appalachian Trail. It's about 17 miles south of the Priest. In fact, the Priest is actually the last place that anybody heard from or saw Scott Lilly, and this occurred on July 31st, 2011. And this is pretty crazy because that means almost two weeks went by between the last time Scott Lilly was seen or heard from and the time that his body was discovered. He had allegedly camped at the priest shelter around the time that he was last seen, and it seems like his intention was for that next day to hike to Cow Camp Gap Shelter. And given that his body was found very, very close to the shelter, it seems as though he made it before he was murdered. Scott Lilly's body was found in a shallow grave, and later on when an autopsy was done, his death was ruled, I have a really hard time with this word, so do forgive me, asphyxia by suffocation, which obviously meant the death was ruled a homicide. And one thing that strikes me as really bizarre about these circumstances is that most of his backpacking gear was missing from the crime scene. And this included his blue or purple backpack, his Ozark Trail hiking shoes, and one of his, as through hikers and backpackers, we would call luxury items, which was a small, handheld Nintendo game. Like I said, none of this stuff was found at the crime scene, and to my knowledge, none of it has ever been found. And I bring this up because 
it's assumed these items were taken by the killer. Now, I'm not here to try to solve this case. I just simply want to tell Scott Lilly's story. But if I had to interject just a little bit, I just find it really hard to imagine that another through hiker or backpacker could have killed him and then taken his stuff because that backpacker would have already had all of their heavy gear. Again, this is 2011. So yes, ultralight backpacking was a thing back then, but it wasn't nearly as common, so gear was heavier. And even if it was just as common, I just think it's really hard to imagine another backpacker killing him and then carrying out his gear in addition to their own gear and not being detected. That just seems very unlikely to me. Definitely possible, don't get me wrong. And again, I don't know the answers to this case, but it just doesn't seem like the most probable scenario. Since Scott Lilly's murder took place on federal land in the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest, the FBI became the primary agency responsible for the investigation. However, they weren't the only ones investigating because the Virginia State Police, as well as the National Park Service and the US Forest Service was also involved in the investigation. In September of 2011, you know, a short time after the murder had happened and while the investigation was ongoing, the FBI released the trail names of five different hikers who they think may have had contact with Scott Lilly just before the time of his murder. And the thing that's kind of crazy about this is they got those names because they looked at the shelter logbooks. And I don't know, I've just signed so many of those shelter logbooks over the years. I'm sure a lot of people watching have as well. And so it's just kind of crazy to think that one of those entries that you might have left in a shelter logbook could someday be looked at by the FBI as a potential piece of evidence in a very, very serious murder case. And by the way, I'm not gonna list the trail names of these people that were mentioned because as far as I'm aware, none of them were ever implicated in the crime. As the investigation continued, the combined agencies ended up interviewing 83 different people. And this included every long distance hiker that was in the area around the time of the murder, as well as a lot of folks who might have had information about Scott Lilly or the case that were not involved in the hiking community. And then in 2012, there was a $10,000 reward that was put up for anyone with information that could lead to the arrest and conviction of Scott Lilly's killer. And doing my research, I'm not really sure if this reward came from the FBI themselves or from the family of Scott Lilly. I got some kind of conflicting information there, but I do know that this reward was put up. And I also know that the investigating authorities were particularly interested in hearing from 2011 through hikers. And that makes sense because obviously they might have had some connection to Scott Lilly. Not saying that, again, any of them were implicated in the crime, but if anything, Thing, maybe they could provide some information that could have helped the investigation. But they were also interested in hearing from 2012 hikers. And I think the reason for this was because they wanted to know if anyone in the area, you know, just a year after the murder occurred, might have noticed anything unusual. I'm assuming here, but I imagine that maybe they were looking for hikers who might have accidentally stumbled across any of that missing gear that was taken from Scott Lilly after he was murdered. And another thing I want to note here is that so far the authorities have not drawn any connections to other murders or disappearances in the area. Because it's kind of crazy, a lot of the high profile murder cases that have happened on the Appalachian Trail seem to have taken place in Virginia. But it does seem like there was some speculation that Scott Lilly's case might have been connected to some of the other ones like the double murder that took place in Shenandoah National Park. But again, the authorities have pretty clearly stated that they have no reason to believe that Scott Lilly's murder was connected to any of these other ones, it really does seem like an isolated incident. Despite all of the investigations and the reward that was put out, nobody knows who killed Scott Lilly. No suspects have ever been named and Unfortunately, the case seems to have gone cold. I wasn't involved in the through hiking community in 2011. I'm pretty sure I didn't even know what the Appalachian Trail was in 2011, but I went back and did some research online and it seems like at the time and just after the murder, there was some chatter amongst people online about it. But in recent times, it seems like that chatter has pretty much dried up to zero, not only among hikers, but also among the media and even the police. This is just my personal opinion and there's definitely a chance that I missed something here but from what I've seen online it doesn't seem like investigators have released any new information about the case or any calls for more information from the public 
since 2012, just the year after it happened. Again, I definitely could have missed something there. So if you've noticed any press releases from the authorities about this case since 2012, please leave a comment and let me know. There has been a few true crime podcasts and like blogs that have covered this story a little bit more recently, but even those are pretty few and far between. And I think what's most startling and just bizarre to me is that I haven't seen anybody involved with the trail community Talk about this story, talk about this case. And to be totally clear, I'm not saying that's the case because people don't care. I think people in the trail community and people who love the Appalachian Trail just simply don't know about Scott Lilly and what happened to him. I know the chances of this video making a difference in the case is basically zero, but again, I just feel like more people need to be talking about what happened to Scott Lilly. And of course, on the tiny chance that anyone watching this actually has any information about what happened to Scott Lilly, call the number on the screen right now. When I through hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018, I met some of the kindest people of my entire life. The type of people who would just give you the shirt right off of their back for absolutely nothing in return. And I don't want to speak for the masses here, but I have a feeling that pretty much everybody who hiked the AT has the same experience that I did. But imagine for a second that lurking among all those kind and generous people was a man that was on the run, not just from the police, but from the freaking FBI. For six years, James Hammis used the Appalachian Trail and his identity as a thru-hiker to evade capture. For six years, he disguised himself as just another one of those kind and generous hikers, and he developed a pretty positive reputation within the trail community. But little did all the hikers around him know, James Hammis was a big time criminal. So big time, in fact, that his story was featured on TV shows such as American Greed and America's Most Wanted. This is one of the craziest stories in Appalachian Trail history. Prior to 1998, Hammis lived a pretty normal life. He had a wife, a family, and he was working a respectable job as a controller for a family-owned beverage bottling company. This company was called G&J Pepsi Cola Bottlers Inc. and they were a distributor of Pepsi products based in Cincinnati, Ohio. In February of 2009, Hammis was called to his employer's headquarters to answer some questions from the FBI about fraud within the company. During this interview, he maintained his innocence and denied knowing anything about the fraud. But his actions after the interview tell a much different story because after he walked out that door, he vanished. He left his family and his work behind and began a new life on the run from the law. Many criminals on the run end up fleeing the country or maybe laying low in a shady hotel or staying with friends, something like that. But Hamas had a different idea. He decided it was time to go for a hike. But what exactly was Hammis running from in the first place? Well, according to the FBI, between 1998 and early 2009, Hammis embezzled, are you ready for this? $8.7 million from his employer. <laughs> Almost $9 million over an 11 year period is just absolutely insane. Hemis's position made him responsible for the financial accounting and internal controls for his company's division. This allowed him to set up phantom bank accounts for an existing vendor, deposit large sums of money into those bank accounts, and then transfer all that money into his personal accounts. He also invested much of the money into the stock market and even made tax payments on it. But eventually the IRS did catch on because while he did pay nearly three million dollars in taxes, he still failed to file tax returns for multiple years during this stint. And the IRS wasn't the only organization that was catching on to James Hammis either. Eventually, bank employees working for his employer and the vendor he was taking advantage of discovered canceled checks being returned from a bank they were unfamiliar with. And this marked the beginning of the end of James Hammis's scheme. It's at this point that he was interviewed by the FBI and promptly fled to where else? but America's most well-known footpath, the Appalachian Trail. James Hammis spent the next six years, six years basically living on the Appalachian Trail. I wasn't really able to find information about whether he was literally hiking the entire time or maybe he was spending time on the trail and then also spending time in towns along the trail, but it does seem like he was either doing one of those two things the entire six years. He even adopted a trail name, which was Bismarck, and 
Honestly, it pains me to say this, but hanging out among through hikers on a long distance trail like this is actually a pretty clever way to blend in. It's easy to hide your true identity because everyone's going by a trail name or a nickname. And it's definitely not unheard of to spend a lot of time with other hikers and never learn their actual real names. In addition to that, as someone who's spent a lot of time through hiking, life on the trail is just different. People don't always share all the details about their life back home, about about their family, about their jobs and history and these things. And when they do talk about these things, it's very common to keep things pretty vague. And so I don't think this would have arisen any suspicion about Hamas whatsoever. And in fact, it didn't. By all personal accounts, and there's a lot of them because Hamas was pretty well known along the trail by the time he was caught, he was a really kind and generous person, just like the vast majority of other hikers on the Appalachian Trail. In fact, when I was researching for this video, I was watching some of the news videos on YouTube about when he was caught. And on these videos, I saw multiple comments from people who said they personally got to know and hiked with Bismarck. And they all said he was a great guy. I met him and hiked with him and his girlfriend in 2014 on the AT. He was the nicest guy you would want to meet. I was so shocked when he was arrested the following year. Bismarck and Hopper, which I think is that girlfriend that was referred to in the previous comment, saved me in the 100 mile wilderness in early October 2000. 2012. Running super low on food, dealing with the weather from Hurricane Sandy, it was brutal. They saved me and got me back into town. We took a zero and headed out the next day. There's a lot of accounts like this online from people that got to know Bismarck. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there's someone watching this video right now that hiked with him on the AT at some point during his stint out there. And if that's the case, and you're comfortable doing so, of course, leave a comment and let us all know what he was like. Of course, the fact that I'm telling you all these details of of James Hammes's story means that he did eventually get caught. And the way it went down is gonna sound pretty crazy to anyone who's familiar with the Appalachian Trail or the culture that surrounds it. Because of how much money James Hammes embezzled, almost $9 million, his case was very high profile. So much so that it was actually featured on TV shows about missing fugitives. One of these shows was American Greed, which aired an episode about Hammes in 2012. And a few years later, an Appalachian Trail through hiker happened to catch a rerun of that episode. Ultimately, this is what led to his downfall. This hiker had met Hamas for the first time shortly into their through hike in March of 2014. And they ended up spending a pretty decent amount of time with him over the next few months. And in early 2015, after this hiker had gotten home from the trail, they just happened to catch this rerun episode of American Greed and they recognized their friend that they had known as Bismarck. This person contacted the FBI pretty soon after and even let the FBI know that Hamas was planning on attending the Trail Days Festival later that year. You could probably see where this is going. On May 16th, 2015, the FBI came a knock in on the door of the Montgomery's Inn in Damascus, Virginia. Damascus is a small but popular town that the Appalachian Trail runs directly through, which also hosts the Trail Days Festival every year. Hamas had frequently stayed at this inn over over the years so often that he actually got to know the owner of the inn and she said that he was one of her favorite guests. After they arrived, the agents showed the inn's owner a picture of Hamas and she confirmed that he was staying there right now. The agents went into his room and they arrested him. By all accounts, it was peaceful. There were no guns drawn. There was no violence. He just got caught and the gig was finally up for Bismarck. But this isn't the end of the story. In fact, there's actually a whole nother event, for a lack of a better word, that potentially involves James Hammes and his shady behavior. Hammes's fraud was definitely illegal, and I don't want to downplay that. I really think that he should be held accountable for his crimes. However, embezzlement is a non-violent offense. And also, given the victim of his offense was a company, not even like an individual person, I think it's reasonable to assume that some people might have sympathy for him. Maybe Maybe even actually be rooting for him. I did see some of this in the comments of the other videos I was talking about earlier. So if you're finding yourself in that category, you might want to listen up a little bit closer. In 2003, so while Hamas was in the middle of this whole fraud scheme, his wife died 
in a mysterious fire at their home. Hamas was allegedly out jogging at the time, which is kind of bizarre to me because the fire happened after 10.30 p.m. It happened at night. Not really like a normal time you would go jogging, but I guess it's not unheard of either. With all that said, I very strongly believe in innocence until guilt is proven. And James Hamas was never proven guilty in his wife's death. He was never proven to have started that fire. In fact, when the fire was investigated, the authorities didn't find any evidence of accelerants used, and they ultimately ruled the fire an accident. And I really doubt that anybody questioned this at the time. That is, until 2009, when James Hammes disappeared and his fraud became known to the public. Still, to this day, there's no evidence that James Hammes purposefully set the fire and killed his wife. All I'm saying is that it's a little bit suspicious given his actions a few years later. At the very least, I just want you to keep in mind that James Hammes and his wife had a daughter together, and that daughter lost her mother in the fire and then a few years later, at age 22, she was essentially abandoned by her one remaining parent when Hamas vanished and went on the run. So even if you don't think that he started the fire that killed his wife, and even if you can look past the non-violent crime of embezzlement, at the very least, he abandoned his daughter, and I just don't think there's any way that you can justify that. In addition to that, although this is much less serious, Hamas's story caused a lot of drama within the Appalachian Trail community. Yes, it's a fascinating story, and no, he never hurt anybody on the trail, but I still don't see any benefit to the trail or its culture that came out of this whole fiasco. It's just such a bizarre story, and honestly, I think it's kind of an insult to all of the great people that love the Appalachian Trail, that hike along the Appalachian Trail, that are not using it to hide some very, very shady behavior. In October of 2015, James Hammes pled guilty to wire fraud charges and was sentenced to eight years in prison. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. On a late spring day in 1974, two young and weary hikers were nearing the end of a day on the Appalachian Trail. And while they walked down a side trail leading to a campsite and shelter, they had no idea that the next morning, only one of them would be walking back up it. Waiting for them at the shelter was a disheveled man, one that didn't look like a typical hiker. And this set off the alarm bells for Joel Polson, the older of the two through hikers, who actually whispered his concern to his younger hiking partner, Margaret Harrett. However, despite these initial concerns, by the time dinner was over, Joel had actually warmed up to the mysterious man. He even told Margaret, quote, this guy is all right. And soon after this, everyone went to bed. Eventually morning came and Joel, for whatever reason, still wanted to just get out of Low Gap as soon as possible. He was already packed up by the time Margaret woke and as she started to gather her things, Joel walked over to a nearby stream to go and clean up. And as he did this, the strange man that the two had shared the campsite with woke up and hopped out of the shelter. Margaret began to put on her boots. She was nearly done lacing them up, anticipating what was surely to be a difficult day on the trail, when all of a sudden, she heard a loud bang. It was a gunshot, and this gunshot would prove to be the start of a nightmare that would drag on way longer than anybody, especially Margaret herself, expected. Within a few short hours, Margaret would once again be heading north on the Appalachian Trail, except this time, instead of doing it willingly, she was doing it at gunpoint. She was following the lead of a madman who had just killed her hiking partner and now had absolutely nothing to lose. This is the story of Ralph Howard Fox, the very first Appalachian Trail killer. When I through hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018, I spent the fourth night of what would end up being a 140 night hike 
at Low Gap Shelter in Georgia. At the time, I didn't know anything about the events that had transpired there. And to start off here, I'm just gonna say that if you're planning on hiking the Appalachian Trail in the future, I'd suggest maybe waiting to watch this video until after you've already finished the trail. But for everybody else, please join me on a trip to Georgia. Now this trip is free, but you must hit the subscribe button to cover the cost of admission, especially if you're a repeat viewer and you found yourself watching a number of my videos. In 1974, Joel Polson met Margaret Harrett while she was working at a restaurant and almost immediately invited her on the trip of a lifetime. He asked her if she wanted to join him on a through hike of the Appalachian Trail. 26 year old Joel was not an experienced hiker by any stretch of the imagination, but with that said, he was no stranger to adventure and the outdoors. A few years earlier, he had actually ridden his bicycle from his hometown in Hartsville, South Carolina, all the way to Northern Ohio. I know that he also did at least one other long distance bicycle trip. And at some point his passion for biking had actually transformed into a newfound passion for backpacking. And he was somehow able to convince 17 year old Margaret, who he again had just met to take on the Appalachian Trail with him. Margaret Harrett was no hiker either, but curiosity had gotten the best of her. At the time, she was a student at the University of South Carolina, and she hadn't really been enjoying it. She figured that an adventure like the Appalachian Trail would provide her some clarity, maybe even some direction on what she should do next. And in addition to that, she just liked Joel Polson's attitude. To be clear, there was no romance between the two, but Polson shared Margaret's sense of adventure and she also trusted him. And so after bending the truth a little bit to her parents, convincing them that she would be part of a 15 person expedition on the AT instead of just the two of them through hiking, Margaret and Joel reached their starting point on the trail. The actual Southern terminus of the AT was 37 miles south of their location, but Joel had actually already hiked that section of the trail and therefore Tesnati Gap would be the Southern terminus of their hike. On the first day of their hike, Joel and Margaret got a very late start. And as a result, they didn't cover many miles that first day and all of the miles that they did do were in the dark. And so the next morning they woke up and began their first full day of hiking and they quickly realized how difficult the Appalachian Trail really was. Despite incredible advancements in backpacking gear and technology, even today, a through hike of the Appalachian Trail is not easy whatsoever. And so I can only imagine that in the early 70s, it must have just been even more ridiculously difficult. And it's honestly no surprise to me that less than 100 people had completed the AT in the year before this story took place, 1973. Nowadays, that number is well over a thousand pretty much every single year. Margaret and Joel were carrying very heavy external frame packs and Margaret had actually began to get blisters before lunchtime even arrived. But despite this, they trudged on and they eventually stopped to chat with a group of workers who were out doing trail maintenance. They continued hiking after this, and finally, by late afternoon, they reached a junction for low gap shelter. At this point in the day, they had only hiked six miles, but they decided that they didn't wanna go any further and that Low Gap would be their home for the night. And therefore, Joel and Margaret made their way down the 200 yard side trail towards the shelter. When they arrived at this shelter, there was a man inside who introduced himself as Ralph. There was nobody else there. And so the three of them would all be sharing camp together that night. Margaret didn't really think twice about the man in the shelter. Perhaps she had let her guard down due to exhaustion. I mean, after all, she had been on trail for nearly 24 hours at this point. But Joel, on the other hand, well, he got a weird feeling about this man. His gut was telling him that something wasn't right. And he actually got anxious when he and Margaret walked down to the water source away from the shelter. While down there, Joel told Margaret that this Ralph man 
did not look like a typical hiker. He wasn't wearing normal hiking attire and he didn't have the typical gear that a hiker would carry. Joel and Margaret had left their packs in the shelter right next to Ralph and Joel feared that this man might be in the process of stealing their belongings at that very moment. And so they quickly walked back up to the shelter and were relieved to find that Ralph hadn't touched any of their gear. Over the next few hours, not much conversation took place between the pair and Ralph, but apparently Joel did actually start to slowly warm up to the man. Warm up both figuratively, but also literally. And what I mean by that is one of the things that actually changed Joel's mind was Ralph's repeated trips to gather firewood, which is no easy task, by the way, especially after a long day of hiking. He even told Margaret, quote, this guy is all right. There were still seeds of doubt in the back of Joel's mind, however. He insisted that he and Margaret leave the shelter early the next morning, and when morning came around, he held true to this. By the time Margaret woke up, Joel had already packed up all of his gear, and he was eager to hit the trail. Sensing some urgency in his demeanor, Margaret quickly started to get ready, while Joel made one last trip down to the stream to freshen up. Now this stream is not very far away from the front of the shelter. And so Margaret was actually able to watch as Joel bent down to splash some water on his face and then turn around to walk back towards the shelter. While all this was going on, Margaret also watched as Ralph hopped out of the shelter. Margaret then looked down and began lacing her boots. She was nearly finished doing this when all of a sudden she heard a loud blast and saw that Joel was now slumped on the ground. It quickly became apparent what had happened. Seemingly out of nowhere, Ralph had attacked. Ralph then came back into the shelter and tied Margaret up. He then led her outside and away from the shelter and tied her to a tree. He then told her that he didn't know what he was gonna do with her and this wasn't a part of some master plan. And Ralph's actions would soon prove that he wasn't kidding. He literally didn't have a clue what to do next. And he was just running off of pure evil instinct. About 15 minutes passed and then Ralph returned to untie Margaret. It's at this point that she asked him where Joel was to which Ralph replied, quote, I got rid of him. Joel Polson had officially become the first victim of murder in Appalachian Trail history. Still unsure of what to do next, Ralph began going through Joel's gear looking for money. And then, for the second time, he marched Margaret back into the woods and tied her up. He told her that he was not going to kill her, but was instead gonna leave her tied up with some water and food and that he was gonna leave a note at the shelter saying where she was. I guess he thought that someone would see the note and come find her. I don't know, but he did this and then he walked away. But just like the first time, 15 minutes later, he came back. And this time, Margaret thought for sure that he was gonna kill her. But instead, Ralph came back with a confession. He told Margaret that he had killed Joel because he wanted his gear and that Joel was too big of a man for Ralph to just simply take it from him otherwise. He also said that he didn't feel right leaving Margaret tied up in the woods because it could potentially kill her if nobody saw the note. In a random burst of twisted compassion, he told Margaret that he didn't want to kill her and that he had, quote, never whacked a chick before. This would end up being the first of numerous instances where Ralph took pity on Margaret, which is one of the most bizarre things about this story. Margaret was the only witness to Joel's murder and the only person who could potentially point the finger at Ralph and there he was all alone in the middle of the woods with her. Conventional wisdom, as scary as it sounds, would assume that a psychopath killer like Ralph would murder Margaret too, right then and there. Ralph didn't do that. Instead, he told Margaret that if she wanted to, she could stay tied up or she could join him and actually hike out to the next highway where he would then let her go. Faced with these options, Margaret chose to hike 
and before she knew it, she was back on the Appalachian Trail heading north with an armed murderer guiding her from behind. At the start of their trek, Ralph told Margaret that if she told any other hikers about what was happening, he would kill her and then kill all the other hikers. A chilling threat that definitely didn't help Margaret's confidence in her ability to make it to the highway alive. But after this, Ralph's twisted compassion would come out again as he made sure that Margaret was comfortable on their hike. Margaret was actually quoted saying, he, referring to Ralph, was unbelievably kind to me. He really was. He kept being sure I had food and that I rested when we were coming down the mountain. I rested as much as I wanted. But Margaret would soon be put to the test when her and Ralph passed some workers doing trail maintenance. When they encountered these workers, Margaret froze in fear because she realized that one of the men was in the group that her and Joel had stopped and chatted with the previous day. She was afraid that this worker would recognize her and realize that something wasn't right. This man did in fact recognize Margaret and through a twist of fate, he somehow didn't realize that she was now hiking with a different man. Maybe it was because Ralph was now wearing Joel's backpack or maybe the worker just wasn't very observant. Either way, the groups eventually parted ways and nobody was hurt. During their conversation, Ralph and Margaret had received some intel from the workers and this intel wasn't good. Apparently the next road crossing north was a much further hike than they realized and this made Margaret scared that she would likely need to spend at least one night, possibly more, in the woods with Ralph. He hadn't hurt her yet and apparently had been quite nice to her, but she still feared that after a long day of hiking, he wouldn't be feeling so generous. While Ralph and Margaret hiked, they passed the time by doing what anyone else would, just simply talking. They talked about mundane things like books and music, and eventually Margaret took the opportunity to pry into Ralph's history just a bit. He told her that he was from up north and that he actually felt much more comfortable in the wilderness of the Western United States than in the Appalachian Mountains. He also told her that he had been in and out of jail for years and that he was actually on the run from the FBI. Eventually, Ralph and Margaret stopped at Rocky Knob Shelter to take a break and consult their maps. And when they did this, they realized that the intel they had been given by the workers earlier was actually wrong. In reality, they were less than three miles away from the next road crossing and they could probably make it before night if they hustled. This was good news for Margaret. She would no longer have to camp out in the woods with Joel's killer. However, this good news was quickly followed by bad news. Ralph decided that he would no longer be letting Margaret go at the road crossing and would instead let her go after the two spent the night hunkered down in a hotel. They hiked on and eventually made it to the road at Unicoi Gap. Ralph then reminded Margaret that if she said anything about being held against her will or about Joel for that matter, then everyone who heard it would be shot. And then the two stuck out their thumbs and they quickly hitched a ride into the town of Helen, Georgia. Using money and traveler's checks that Ralph had stolen from Joel, the two of them checked into the Chattahoochee Motel under the names Mr. and Mrs. Joel Polson. At this point, Margaret was more scared than ever, and rightfully so. I mean, she was going to be stuck in a hotel room with this maniac who knows what he was going to do next. However, thankfully, instead of laying a finger on Margaret, Ralph instead turned on the TV and tried to see if Joel's death had made it onto the news yet. And it would turn out that it hadn't. And so Ralph felt safe for the moment. They ate some food and then Margaret took a shower. Ralph followed her into the bathroom, but only to make sure that she didn't escape out the window. He actually didn't even touch her, let alone try to 
you know. Afterwards, they got to talking again, and their conversation was just as strange as the one that had taken place while they were hiking. Ralph told Margaret that he could tell how nervous she had been on the hike earlier in the day, and that he had actually almost given her the gun just so she would know that he wasn't going to shoot her. He told her bizarre things like that he personally knew folk singer Arlo Guthrie, and he even told her that, quote, he wished that he could have met me, referring to Margaret, under other circumstances, that if he hadn't been doing all this, then he could really like me. But then the conversation turned more sinister. Margaret asked Ralph if he had ever killed anyone before Joel, and Ralph answered yes. However, he insisted it was, quote, more or less a kind of a fight or self-defense or something. I really doubt that made Margaret feel any better, but she still managed to fall asleep that night and actually slept pretty good. In the morning, they packed up and got some coffee and Ralph still insisted that he was gonna let Margaret go. However, he didn't feel comfortable letting her hitchhike back to her home in Columbia, South Carolina. In yet another instance of Ralph's twisted compassion, he thought the idea of Margaret hitchhiking alone was far too dangerous for her. Instead, they would go to a bus station and they would each catch a separate bus. They thumbed a ride to Cleveland, Georgia and eventually arrived at the bus station. For the first time since Ralph had shot Joel, Margaret must have been thinking that she might actually make it home alive. She walked up to the counter and asked for a ticket to Columbia, but she was then told that there were no direct routes that would get her home. Margaret was, again, forced back into Ralph's captivity and the two of them hitched another ride to a different bus station. Once they arrived, they had to wait for a while, but eventually they were able to purchase their tickets. Margaret bought a ticket to Columbia and Ralph bought a ticket to Atlanta. They still had some time to kill before their departures and this gave Ralph one last opportunity to walk the line between compassion and threats. He told Margaret that he knew that she would tell the police what had happened and he was still letting her go anyways. But he also warned that if she went to the police immediately and they were there waiting for him when he got off the bus in Atlanta, that lots of innocent people were going to die. And shortly after this warning, Ralph got on his bus and then he was gone. Margaret was now free from Ralph's captivity and she was also somehow completely unharmed. I should specify, she was physically unharmed. She was still, however, incredibly scared, and she heeded Ralph's warning about not calling the cops immediately. She took her bus to Columbia, and she arrived later that night. Her first course of action after arriving was to call her brother, but he didn't answer the phone. Then she called a friend, and had similar results. Next, she tried calling her parents, who also didn't answer the phone. And so finally, she called the police and she asked for someone to come pick her up. She told them that she had witnessed a murder in Georgia and she needed to tell them about it. An investigation was launched and on May 11, 1974, Joel Polson's body was found nearby Low Gap Shelter. And a few days later, a woman in Atlanta called police and reported that she recognized a man who matched the description of the Appalachian Trail killer. She had read about the crime in the newspaper. 31-year-old Ralph Howard Fox was arrested at gunpoint on May 16th, 1974. Just as he had told Margaret, he did in fact have a criminal history. He had previously been arrested for kidnapping, car theft, breaking and entering, and much, much more. He was convicted for the murder and was sentenced to life in prison, but somehow managed to get himself let out on parole in mid-1991. And predictably, Ralph Fox would go on to kill again, this time a woman in Michigan, and by the end of 1992, he was once again back behind bars. This time, thankfully, he would remain locked up all the way until his death in 2003. What an absolute miscarriage of justice it was to let him out on parole that first time. Absolutely unbelievable. Margaret Harrett would go on to earn a doctorate degree and have a successful career with the US Agency for International Development. The resilience she displayed during and after her nightmare ordeal is 
absolutely incredible. My heart goes out to her and I hope she's doing well. My heart also goes out to Joel Polson as well as his friends and family. At only 26 years old, he was taken far too soon. And in my opinion, justice was never served in his case due to the fact that Ralph Fox was let out on parole despite having a life sentence. I'd now like to leave you with a very important takeaway from this story, which is to always trust your gut. This story is scary, but the fact remains that every single year, millions of people set foot on the Appalachian Trail without incident. I've said this before, but you're far safer walking on the AT than you are walking down any city street in the United States, which is something that most of us do without thinking twice. But with that said, obviously, really, really scary things do happen. And so if you encounter someone on the AT or any trail for that matter that makes you uncomfortable, make sure that you listen to your gut, pack up your stuff, keep hiking, just get away from this person. Do not spend the night with someone that gives you a bad feeling. Thank you for watching and may Joel Polson rest in peace. During my thru hike of the Appalachian Trail in 2018, I hitchhiked into Rutland, Vermont in order to get some much needed rest. I needed a place to stay when I was there, and so when I learned that there was a free hiker hostel right in the center of town, it seemed like a no-brainer. Right? Well, actually, after talking to some of my friends that I was there with, I realized that this free hostel is run by a cult. And after realizing this, I still decided to stay there. 12 Tribes is the name of the cult and the Yellow Deli is the name of their hostel in Vermont. They've developed a controversial reputation among the Appalachian Trail community, but is that reputation deserved? Are they preying upon weary hikers trying to convert them into their bizarre religion? Or are they just being generous and trying to help out the trail community by giving hikers a place to stay? Let's jump into the story of 12 tribes, their relationship with the Appalachian Trail, and my experience staying with them during my through hike. Defining what exactly 12 tribes is will largely depend on who you ask. And I think it's only fair if we start by reading what their definition is. Quoting from their website, the 12 tribes is an emerging spiritual nation. We are a confederation of 12 self-governing tribes made up of self-governing communities. We are disciples of the son of God, whom we call by his Hebrew name, Yeshua. Yeshua, I'm terrible with pronunciation. I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. With all of our hearts, we want to do our Father's will, which is to love one another and be a light to the nations so that they could see our life of love and know how much their creator loves them. So that's what they call themselves. But according to a lot of other people, 12 Tribes is simply just a Christian fundamentalist cult. Now, I'm not a religious person. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I know anything about Christianity, but I did wanna take a brief look into what makes them different from other Christian groups. And I also wanted to say here, 12 Tribes is quite infamous, and so it can be difficult to get unbiased information about them. I'm trying to be fair and just cover the facts here, but there's a good chance I get something wrong. So I really want to encourage you to go do your own research on 12 Tribes. Don't just take everything said in this video as gospel. 12 Tribes was founded in 1972 in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and has since grown into a worldwide organization with around 3,000 members. My understanding is that 12 Tribes is kind of like a mix between a traditional religious group and a hippie commune, which I know is a really weird mix. For instance, they have strict dress codes for a lack of a better term. All the men have beards and tie their hair back, and all the women dress modestly whatever that means. The women wear baggy dresses and blouses, and they also wear headscarves. This example makes them seem like a traditional religious group, like I just said. But then again, they also have that hippie side that I also just mentioned. They often travel around in something called the Peacemaker Bus. They have organic farms all over the world, and they operate restaurants known as the Yellow Deli, which look like this. It's very strange, not the type of imagery you'd think would come from a religious group that forces their women to dress, again, 
modestly. There's over 20 Yellow Deli locations worldwide, and one of those locations is in Rutland, Vermont, a popular town for Appalachian Trail as well as Long Trail hikers to stop into. I'm not sure if the folks at 12 Tribes knew this about Rutland before they opened the deli there, or if they just got lucky. But either way, it's clear they see the influx of hikers in Rutland as a business opportunity and maybe even as a recruitment opportunity. Now, of course, 12 Tribes isn't gonna come out and be like, yeah, we focus on hikers and try to convert them to our religion. So I wanna be clear, everything I'm about to say here is complete speculation. But with that said, it does kinda seem like they're intentionally targeting hikers on the Appalachian Trail. These hikers are far away from their families, they're living out of a backpack, essentially making them temporarily homeless, and they tend to be pretty open to making new friends and having new experiences. When you put it like that, it seems like Appalachian Trail hikers might be a pretty good target for a religious hippie-like cult to prey upon. And another reason why people suspect they might be targeting hikers is because of the hostel they operate, which is advertised towards people on the Appalachian Trail. They actually own hostels elsewhere as well, but for this video, I'm just going to be talking about the one in Rutland on the AT. Now, hostels exist in pretty much every single town along the Appalachian Trail, so the fact that they're their hostel exists isn't in and of itself suspicious. But most hostels along the trail charge a fee for people to stay there, or at the very least have a suggested donation policy, and they really expect you to pay whatever that specified donation amount is, so it basically is a fee. The Yellow Deli is different, however. Their website explicitly states that they don't expect payment, but rather request a donation or contribution of time to improve the hostel. Again, this policy isn't unheard of from hostels hostels along the trail, but it does seem like they're not really interested in making a profit from the hostel, meaning they maybe have some other intention with it. And from my experience, the other hostels that do have this donation policy are usually doing so because they just really love the Appalachian Trail and their sole intention is to help hikers. And to be fair, that might be the intention of the Yellow Deli. I don't know with certainty, but given they are a religious group or cult and their mission isn't actually focused on on the Appalachian Trail, it just seems a little fishy. And it gets even more fishy because when you stay with them, there's a high likelihood that you'll be invited to get off the trail and spend some time on their nearby farm. Now, by most people's accounts, they're not pushy about this, and I'm gonna talk about my experience shortly here, but at the very least, the opportunity to go spend some time on their farm will be mentioned to you by one of the workers, or you'll see it on signs and flyers around the hostel. But even under the assumption that they are, in fact, targeting hikers, is it really that big of a deal? I mean, it's just a bunch of harmless hippies after all, right? Well, yes, but there have been some controversies surrounding the 12 tribes that hikers might want to know about before they choose to stay with them. To be clear, none of these controversies involve hikers specifically. It's got nothing to do with the Appalachian Trail. But still, there's been some shady accusations against 12 tribes, particularly in relation to the way they treat their children. So this is really awkward for me to talk about, honestly, but it's seems as though, from my understanding, physical discipline is a pretty standard way for 12 tribes parents to punish their children. I'm not saying that these parents are just going around like beating up their children all the time, but their own website clearly states that they quote, teach that parents are to promptly spank their children whenever they disobey, which is weirdly phrased at the very least, but it's not exactly unheard of for parents to do this regardless of what their religion is. It does start to get sketchy though when you look into their history with child abuse claims. In 1984, authorities raided the 12 tribes commune in Island Pond, Vermont over allegations of child abuse. Nothing ever came of the raid though, because a judge ruled that the raid was unconstitutional. So to be clear, they were never punished for this, and we really don't know with any type of certainty what was going on, if there was child abuse, it's just very unclear, and, and nobody was ever charged with it that I'm aware of. In fact, some of the children that were living at Island Pond at the time have come out and said that there was no abuse taking place. But then on the other hand, some of the other children have since left the 12 tribes religion or cult and insisted that the abuse definitely occurred. And there's also been more recent allegations coming out of Germany. In 2013, German officials took 40 children from the group and placed them into foster care. The whole situation is pretty complicated. I'm not gonna cover it all in this video. So once again, I suggest that you do some more research on this. In addition, in addition to these 
these child abuse accusations, there have been other accusations against 12 tribes as well. Some of these relating to poor treatment of women, racism. Again, there's plenty of stories out there about this and you can go look into that. I'm not gonna cover everything in this video. And so with all that said, you might think that the Yellow Deli is pretty much just avoided by everybody on the Appalachian Trail. But that's actually not the case. The El Deli has a pretty mixed reputation among hikers. It's not all bad. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I stayed at the 12 Tribes Yellow Deli Hostel in Rutland, Vermont on my Appalachian Trail through hike. It definitely wasn't my idea to stay there. The reason I did was because my friends wanted to, I think largely driven by the fact that it was free or just, you know, a simple donation. I didn't know much about them at the time. I definitely didn't know about these crazy accusations. All I knew is that they were commonly referred to as a cult. I knew it was a religious thing and it just seemed weird to me, but I also was kind of intrigued. And so my friends wanted to go and I went with them. Honestly, the number one thing I remember from my time there was that the food was really, really good. Obviously it's called the Yellow Deli. I've mostly focused on the hostel in this video, but there also is a deli there, just like a normal restaurant that's open to the public. As much as people do tend to kind of rip on the Yellow Deli, I don't think you'll find many people out there saying their food wasn't at the very least pretty tasty. But apart from the food, like I said, I was pretty hesitant to go there. And so I knew that there was a chance that someone was gonna invite me to the farm or maybe try to like recruit me or, or do all this stuff. And I went into the hostel with the idea of just minimizing my interactions with the employees. Of course, I wasn't gonna be rude, but I really did avoid like having any conversations with them outside of just the, you know, taking care of business kind of stuff. Like where do I sleep and, you know, ordering food and that thing. I remember there definitely was information about the farm kind of scattered throughout the hostel. Like I said earlier, flyers and posters, things like that. But as far as I can remember, no employees or workers or members of the 12 tribes came up to me and specifically tried to get me to join or tried to get me to go to this weird farm. Again, this is just my experience, but I can tell you that they were definitely not pushy. And having talked to other hikers about this, as well as reading things online, it seems like that's a fairly normal experience. There's a lot of people out there that claim they had a great stay with the Yellow Deli. And honestly, I did too. The only, I guess, somewhat bizarre thing I remember from my stay was that they were pretty explicit that men and women could not share bunks and like even rooms, I think. I think they had separate rooms for each gender, which yeah, that's that's kind of weird. You're not gonna find that at most hostels, but I feel like there's probably other places that do this as well that aren't religious. I can't remember any off the top of my head, but it's impossible to really say how many hikers have stayed there. I wish there was like a central source where you could just get tons of different experiences from everybody when they stayed there. But unfortunately, the closest thing we have to that is random comments on the internet from Reddit and from various articles. Obviously take this with a grain of salt. These people could be embellishing. I don't know. This is just the best thing we got in order to get a more general sense of how people liked their stay there. I was picked up by a guy who said his friends were making dinner and they had brought hikers back before and figured it was his turn. We got to a huge house and walked into the group in worship. I felt like he hid the truth in order to get me there. I asked for a ride back to the trail and had to refuse several appeals to give the group a chance. I had a bad knee and stayed with those folks for about a week during my 2007 hike. They were always very warm and welcoming to me. I'm glad I got to meet them. They of course are trying to recruit, but I never felt overly pressured. I told them if I ever joined a cult, they'd be it. During my 2017 through, I thought they were very nice people, but something was just off about the whole situation. Also, not sure if I misread the situation, but I believe they were requiring the female hikers to do chores to stay at the hostel, but not the men. I don't remember anything like that happening, but who knows? Again, this is just comments on the internet. In my own experience, I had a lady grasp my hands and tell me to quote, just stay with them when I express gratitude for their free hiker dinner. Let me know what you guys think. And once again, please hit that subscribe button. 80% of my viewers aren't subscribed right now. So please hit that subscribe button. On July 3rd, 1986, a woman in Bartow, Florida spent an evening hanging out at a local bar. At some point that night, she befriended a man and offered him a ride home. It's not exactly clear what happened that night, but one thing we do know for sure, Clemmy Jewel Arnold was murdered in cold blood that night. And four years later, her killer, still on the loose, decided to go for a hike 
on the Appalachian Trail. Flash forward to September 11th, 1990, and an Appalachian Trail Conservancy worker was surveying land along a roadwalk portion of the trail just outside of Duncannon, Pennsylvania. She noticed a rough looking man walking along the trail and something about him just gave her a bad feeling. He was wearing combat boots, a flannel, and carrying two red gym bags. He didn't look like a hiker, and because he was walking along the road portion of the trail after all, she figured it was just a coincidence, he was homeless, and he was just drifting off to go hitchhike somewhere else along the roads. But then two hours later, further north along the roadwalk, she encountered him again. This startled her because it was now clear that this creepy man was in fact walking the AT, and he was just about to reach the portion of trail that leaves the road and re-enters back into the woods. The woman did nothing, however. I mean, what was she supposed to do after all? The man wasn't breaking any laws and he seemed to be minding his own business. However, unbeknownst to her, this man was carrying a pistol and a nine inch double edged knife. And only two days later, he would use these weapons to commit one of the worst crimes in Appalachian Trail history. This is the tragic story of Molly LaRue and Jeff Hood, two through hikers who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is a tough one, folks. It's a really sad story. I'm gonna get into it here, but real quick, I do just wanna ask you to please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. 80% of the people who have been viewing my videos lately are not subscribed. I recently passed 200,000, and I'm trying to get this channel to 300,000 next, so please hit that subscribe button. That would mean a lot. Okay, let's do it. On June 3rd, 1990, Molly LaRue and Jeff Hood climbed Mount Katahdin, which is the northern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. The next day, they began walking south with ambitions of making it all the way to the end of the trail at Springer Mountain in Georgia. Like many AT through hikers before and after them, their first few days out there were tough as they adjusted to life on the trail. LaRue wrote in her journal, quote, we reminded one another before we started this ordeal that there would be tough days days we would ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Well, we had one of those days. But despite the difficult beginning, the couple trudged on and very quickly became more comfortable and confident in their hiking abilities. They even picked up trail names. Hood went by Clevis and LaRue by Nalgene. Jeff Hood was 26 years old and from Signal Mountain, Tennessee, and Molly LaRue was a year younger and from Shaker Heights, Ohio. They had met each other at a church-sponsored program in Salina, Kansas, where they both worked to take at-risk youths out on backcountry adventures. However, in the spring of 1990, they were both laid off from their jobs and decided to spend their now extra free time by taking on a through hike of the Appalachian Trail. At one point, LaRue made a phone call to her father telling him about her plans to hike the trail and it's at this point that she also announced that she had officially begun a relationship with Hood. The couple was moving at a slow but steady pace south, and by July 20th, they were almost done hiking through their second state, the state of New Hampshire. They continued south from here for over 600 miles before finally reaching the town of Duncannon, Pennsylvania, just shy of the halfway point on their hike. While in Duncannon, LaRue and Hood stayed at the Doyle Hotel, which is a famous spot for through hikers to stop into. I stayed at the Doyle on my AT through hike. I don't know how it was in 1990, but in 2018, it was charming for sure, but definitely a little bit run down. It did, however, have an awesome restaurant and bar on the ground floor, and I like to imagine that LaRue and Hood's time at the Doyle was similar to mine. I'm sure they stuffed themselves full of food, drank a few yinglings, and then retired upstairs to their room to rest their weary bodies. There was one thing that was definitely different between their stay and mine, however, and that's because while they were at the Doyle, they called their parents and made plans to meet them in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, which is considered the psychological halfway point of the Appalachian Trail. Making it to Harper's Ferry is a major milestone for through hikers. During these phone calls, they also informed their families that when they arrived in Harper's Ferry, they had something special to tell them. Hood's sister believes that they were gonna announce their engagement. Tragically, however, whatever it is that the couple planned to tell their families will never be known. And that's because the couple never made it to Harper's Ferry. 
In fact, they hardly even made it out of Duncannon. The next day, September 12th, 1990, the couple had a leisurely morning, meeting up with a few of LaRue's relatives and running some trail errands. By 3.45 p.m., they finally headed back to the trail and began climbing up Cove Mountain. Because of the late start, the couple didn't make it far that day. They ended up hiking around four miles and sometime after 5 p.m., they arrived at the now infamous Thelma Marks Shelter. For the time being, they were the only ones there. Thelma Marks Shelter has since been torn down and in its place stands the Cove Mountain Shelter a short distance away. I actually stopped at this shelter very briefly on my Appalachian Trail through hike and took this video while I waited out a rainstorm. I had no idea that I was sitting in an area that had experienced an extreme act of evil some 28 years earlier. Like I said, LaRue and Hood were alone at first that evening, but at some point either later in the night or even perhaps early the next morning, another man showed up. Little is known about what conversations, if any at all, occurred between the couple and this man. It's possible that he never even told them his name. However, within just a few weeks, every single hiker along the Appalachian Trail would know this man's name. It was Paul David Cruz and he was wanted for murder. Paul David Cruz had a rough upbringing. He was abandoned as a child and by age eight, he was adopted by a couple from North Carolina. He would often run away from home and even found himself getting in trouble with police. When he was only 12 years old, only 12, the cops caught him carrying a knife on his belt, which is not a good sign. During his senior year of high school, he dropped out and ran away once once again, only to return later and finish school during the summer. It wasn't long after that that Cruz joined the United States Marine Corps. In 1973, while still actively serving in the military, Cruz ended up marrying his high school sweetheart. But this new marriage and the structure and purpose given to people in the military was still not enough to set him on a good path. Only two weeks after getting married, Cruz attempted suicide and was admitted to a military hospital. Five months later, he would go AWOL, and two months after that, he was discharged from the Marines, and a divorce soon followed. From here, Cruz bounced around to various places, doing various jobs, and eventually he did remarry another woman. However, this marriage didn't work out either. Cruz was a very unstable individual and at one point he even put a knife to his second wife's throat and threatened to kill her. Obviously this marriage also ended in a divorce and by now it was crystal clear to those who knew him that Cruz was heading down a dark and violent Path. This all came to a head in Florida in 1986. On July 3rd, 1986, Cruz killed Clemmy Jewel Arnold after she offered him a ride home from a bar one night. Authorities quickly found evidence that linked him to the murder and began pursuing him. However, he was able to evade them and eventually settled in South Carolina where he just stayed under the radar for years. But then for whatever reason, on September 5th, 1990, Paul David Cruz up and left South Carolina, caught a bus up to Virginia, and began hitchhiking even further north. He stopped in West Virginia, Maryland, and Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and eventually he ended up near Duncannon, Pennsylvania, on the Appalachian Trail more than 500 miles away from his home in Loris, South Carolina. On September 11th, 1990, an Appalachian Trail Conservancy worker was surveying land along a 16 mile stretch of road that the AT followed south of Duncannon, Pennsylvania. She noticed a homeless looking man, a rough looking man walking along the road there, but she assumed that he wasn't following the AT. It was just a coincidence that the trail followed the road in that part. She assumed this because the man didn't look like a hiker. He wore a flannel, jeans and combat boots and he was also carrying two red gym bags. He didn't have any typical hiking gear and there was also a major highway nearby and so she really didn't expect to see him again. She figured he would just hitchhike away and that would be it. However, two hours later on a further north portion of the roadwalk section of the AT, she saw this man again. And of course, as we all know, this man was Paul David Cruz. So at this point, she realized that he was in fact hiking on the Appalachian Trail. And this creeped her out, but 
there wasn't anything that she could do, obviously. At the end of the day, it was just a feeling. He hadn't bothered her, let alone threatened her in any way. And so she drove away, still with an uneasy feeling and Cruz continued hiking north. And the next night, he arrived at Thelma Mark's shelter sometime either in the late evening or early morning after Molly LaRue and Jeff Hood were already there. And what happened next would go on to shock the Appalachian Trail community as well as just the nation as a whole for years to come. At some point between 5 and 7 a.m. on September 13th, Cruz brutally murdered LaRue and Hood using both a pistol and a knife. He also, uh, I don't even know how to say this, you know what did LaRue, I can't say the actual word because of YouTube's rules, but it starts with an R and it ends with an E. I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. It was an absolutely heinous, violent crime Allegedly, Cruz was high on cocaine and he had drank a quart of liquor before he arrived at the shelter. He had no connection to the two slain hikers. It appears that they had just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Later in the day, Cruz continued hiking north as if nothing had happened, except only this time, instead of carrying his two gym bags, he was now carrying a green Gregory backpack the one that belonged to Hood. When he reached Duncan in Pennsylvania, he hitchhiked a little bit further south and eventually rejoined the Appalachian Trail in a different spot, this time hiking south, heading towards Harper's Ferry. It appears that he may have even stole the story that the couple may have told him because he told other hikers that he was a through hiker and that he had started the trail up in Maine back in June. The same day that LaRue and Hood were killed, Another couple that they had actually previously met on trail rolled into Thelma Mark's shelter, hoping to camp there for the evening. That wouldn't end up happening, however, because when they rolled up to the shelter, they became the first people to witness the carnage that Cruz had caused. They immediately turned around and hiked back to Duncannon and alerted police about what they had discovered. That night, state troopers and investigators made their way to Thelma Mark shelter by headlight, and soon after the next morning, all-terrain vehicles navigated their way through the forest to collect the bodies and evidence from the scene. And soon after that, investigators were looking for Paul David Cruz, although they didn't quite know his name yet. They did, however, know about the strange man that the ATC worker had seen a couple days earlier, and they knew that he was carrying red gym bags. One of these bags had been left at the murder scene and another was found at the next shelter south, Darlington Shelter. As the families of the victims grieved, hikers along the Appalachian Trail were on high alert for anyone who looked suspicious. And it's because of this that on September 21st, Paul David Cruz was arrested before he could kill again. Some hikers had noticed that Cruz was carrying Hood's backpack and he wasn't carrying it and the rest of his gear in a way that like a normal experienced hiker who had walked all the way from Maine would. They reported this to the police and just as Cruz was crossing from Maryland into Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, they detained him. They searched the backpack he was wearing and uncovered additional items that belonged to LaRue and Hood. They also found a 22 caliber revolver and a long double-edged knife. Cruz was arrested, brought into custody, and eventually charged with the murders of LaRue and Hood. Prosecutors had a strong case. In addition to the stolen items and murder weapons found in Cruz's possession, they also had DNA evidence against him. However, one thing they didn't have was a motive for the crime. And the truth is, we still don't really have one even to this day. At trial, Cruz lawyers explained his actions by blaming it on a violent outburst brought on by the drugs he was taking, but that doesn't really tell us the full story. Cruz himself, never offered any explanation as to why he killed the innocent couple. Paul David Cruz was eventually found guilty and given the death sentence in Pennsylvania. However, in 2006, this sentence was changed to life in prison, and so that's where he remained for the rest of his life, because in July of 2022, Cruz died in prison. He died of natural causes, sitting there rotting in his cell right where he belonged. In late 2002, Thelma Mark Shelter was torn down and a section of the Appalachian Trail in the area was renamed in the honor of Hood and LaRue. Now, I always get a little bit of flack when I say this, but 
I, I just want to stress that incidents like this are scary and they are real. But at the end of the day, the truth is that they're extremely, extremely rare. You're far safer on the Appalachian Trail, far, far safer than you are walking down the street of just about any city in the US, which is something that pretty much all of us do without even thinking twice about it. Please be safe out there, everybody. And also please keep LaRue, Hood, and their families in your thoughts and in your hearts. June 14th, 1969. This was a day that Bill Martin would never forget. He should have been in the midst of a fun camping trip with his sons, but instead, he found himself in the middle of every father's worst case scenario. It was the day before his son Dennis's seventh birthday, and instead of celebrating, Bill found himself bolting through the woods of the Smoky Mountains shouting Dennis's name at the top of his lungs. The boy had vanished from their campsite, and Bill was desperate to find any sign of Dennis. He shouted and shouted, but Dennis never shouted back. That evening, the sky opened up, inflicting high winds, booming thunderclaps, and nearly three inches of rain on Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Bill Martin had no choice but to just hunker down inside an Appalachian Trail shelter, knowing full well that his son was still out there among feral hogs, dangerous snakes, and black bears. Due to all of this and the bad weather, it seemed basically impossible for Dennis Martin to survive the night. The next morning, park rangers swung into action, searching flooded trails by foot and washed out roads by Jeep. By the afternoon, almost 250 people were combing through the woods. And the next day, that number increased to 300 people. And then 365. Within a week, over 1,000 people reported for duty, each one of them eager to find Dennis Martin. And as more and more people showed up, the search descended into absolute chaos. One searcher fell off a bridge, another shot himself in the leg by accident, and a group of Green Berets trudged so deep into the woods that they ran out of food and had to barbecue a rattlesnake. What started as just one desperate father searching through the woods all by himself had quickly evolved into one of the largest and messiest search operations in national park history. And yet, not one damn thing came of it. Absolutely nothing. This is the mysterious disappearance of Dennis Martin. Now, this is one of the most famous and influential cases that I've ever covered on my channel. It was a landmark case in the world of search and rescue, and it went on to provide invaluable lessons to everyone from experienced searchers all the way down to just casual day hikers. Because of this, I think it's a really important story to tell, and I'd like to thank Drink Element for making it possible for me to tell it. Now, when you're hiking, or even when you're just doing anything that involves you sweating a lot, you need to be replacing your electrolytes. Simply just drinking water is not gonna be enough, and what you should do is replace those electrolytes with Drink Element, and let me tell you why. So many electrolyte drink mixes are just full of sugar and a bunch of other nonsense you really don't want to be putting into your body, but Drink Element is not like that. It has zero sugar. Really, all that Drink Element has is a great taste and the electrolytes that you need to stay hydrated and healthy when you're hiking or doing anything else that requires sweat. And I really mean they have a great taste. They have crazy awesome flavors like citrus salt, grapefruit salt. Those are two of my favorites. And they also have these like very unique flavors like mango chili or lemon habanero, even chocolate salt. Yes, these are actual drink mix flavors that you can get from Drink Element. I think that's so creative and so cool. And after hearing me say all these flavors, you're probably like, Kyle, I wish I could just try all of them. And to that, I'll say you can. What you're gonna do is go to drinkelement.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. That's drinklmnt.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. Go and place an order for whichever flavor you think sounds best. And when you do that through my link, you're gonna get a sample pack 
of eight different flavors thrown in with your order for no extra cost. So you're gonna be able to get to try them all and decide which ones you like best. Once again, that's drinklmnt.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. And thank you so much to Drink Element for supporting my channel. Now, let's get into the story. To start off, let's head to the most visited national park in the United States, that is Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Now, instead of charging you an admission fee, all I ask is that you hit that subscribe button, especially if you're a repeat viewer and you've found yourself watching a number of my videos now. That's right, I'm talking to you, thanks. On Father's Day weekend, 1969, the Martin family left their home in Knoxville, Tennessee and headed to the Smoky Mountains. The group consisted of six-year-old Dennis, nine-year-old Douglas, their father, Bill, and their grandfather, Clyde. The trip to Great Smoky Mountains National Park was a family tradition for them, and this was actually Dennis's first time going camping. Dennis Martin was about four feet tall and weighed 55 pounds. And though he had never been camping before, he had been on day hikes in the past, and reportedly he walked so fast that the adults couldn't always keep up with him. By all accounts, he was comfortable and happy being in the woods. The Martin family started their adventure from Cades Cove Campground on Friday, and from there, they hiked up to the Appalachian Trail, which runs right along the dividing ridge between North Carolina and Tennessee. It was perfect hiking weather, and I'm sure the group was absolutely thrilled to get to their first campsite of the trip at Russell Field Shelter. They spent the night here, and then the next day they decided to take it a little bit easier, this time only hiking a few miles north on the Appalachian Trail to the next campsite, Spence Field. And when they arrived at Spence Field, they set up camp and they had no idea what was about to happen next. Nearly 50 years later, I actually did the exact same thing in the exact same spot when I through hiked the Appalachian Trail. It was now 2018 and I'll be honest, at the time, I had no idea about how infamous of a place Spence Field was. I honestly might have rethought my decision had I known about the next series of events in this story. At Spence Field, the Martins were joined by some family friends and sometime in the afternoon, the group sat down to relax. Camp was set up, lunch had been consumed, and the dishes had even been done. So there wasn't much else for the adults to do besides sit there and take in the scenery. For the young boys, however, it was playtime, and the grassy knoll that they were camped out on was the perfect spot for it. Dennis, Douglas, and two other boys that they were with hatched a devious plan to sneak up on all the adults and surprise them. But unbeknownst to the boys, the adults were onto them and they actually watched and laughed as the group of boys split up. Douglas and the two boys went to the south and Dennis went by himself to the north and west towards the Tennessee side of the ridge. All of the adults pretended to be surprised when the boys jumped out at them and rounds of laughter quickly followed. However, within no more than five minutes, nobody was laughing because it's at this point that they finally realized that Dennis had gone missing. Dennis was wearing a red t-shirt at the time, and it's because of this that the boys actually planned for him to sneak around on his own so that his red shirt wouldn't give them away. Bill, Dennis's father, and Clyde, Dennis's grandfather, started calling out Dennis's name, but they heard and saw nothing in return. Getting more and more desperate, they sprung into action and began searching the trails in the surrounding area. Bill Martin traveled south on the Appalachian Trail for about a mile before returning back to Spence Field, hoping that his son would be there waiting for him. When he realized that Dennis was still lost, Bill set out south once again, this time hiking the two and a half miles back to Russell Field, where they had camped that first night. But once again, he was forced to return to Spence Field without his son. And also once again, when he arrived back, Dennis was not there. While Bill was desperately searching along the Appalachian Trail, Clyde made his way off the ridge. He hiked over eight miles back down to Cades Cove campground, and when he arrived, he reached a ranger station. He reported Dennis Martin missing at roughly 8.30 p.m. that night, the day before 
the boy's seventh birthday. This marked the start of a search effort, which would turn into more and more of a cluster with each passing day. Excuse my harsh language there, but I think you're gonna realize what I mean in just a second. That first night that Dennis was reported missing, the search was quite limited. In addition to the searching that Bill and Clyde had done, Rangers interviewed hikers at Spence Field who had traveled in from various directions and trails. None of these hikers interviewed had noticed anything out of the ordinary, let alone actually seen Dennis. And then that night, a massive storm rolled through the Smoky Mountains, dumping down almost three inches of rain in just the span of a few hours. This was extremely unlucky for the search, obviously, but it's also not exactly uncommon. I mean, they are called the Smoky Mountains after all, they're known for volatile weather, and they're actually technically a rainforest. But regardless of what's expected or not expected, these thunderstorms were bad news for the search. Not only did the weather slow down the search right when it was at its most critical point, I mean, the boy had only disappeared a few hours earlier, but after it passed, it left Spence Field and the surrounding area, the entire Great Smoky Mountains National Park, mind you, a muddy, flooded mess. This would hinder the pace of searching the next morning, and it would also potentially cover up important clues and evidence about where Dennis Martin could have ended up. And also, let's just be frank here, it could have killed the boy. Without shelter, he could have easily became hypothermic or been swept away in a flash flood. I mean, it's just, it's just not a good situation. Searchers knew this could have been the case, but regardless, they ramped up their efforts the next day. By the afternoon, there was 240 people in the park searching for Dennis. His mother had also arrived at this point after learning at church that her boy was missing, by the way, super sad. And from there, the number of searchers started to balloon at an absolutely ridiculous rate. Within a week, 1,400 people, some official searchers, many just volunteers, descended upon the Smoky Mountains, all of them eager to find the missing boy. Groups ranging from the Boy Scouts all the way up to the Green Berets showed up. Helicopters, dogs, and even loudspeakers were used, blasting the boy's name, trying to find any sign of him. President Nixon himself even contacted park officials, telling them that he would be following the search. And one might think that there's strength in numbers in a situation like this, but it's actually at this point that the search really started to just fall apart. The magnitude of this search effort had never been seen before and organizing it was all but impossible. Some volunteers reportedly didn't even know how to use a compass or other important searching tools. At one point, a volunteer actually fell off a bridge and broke his arm, requiring medical attention. And then another searcher accidentally shot himself in the leg requiring even more intense medical attention. And those green berets that I mentioned, well, they would end up hiking themselves so deep into the woods that they ran out of food and had to kill and barbecue a rattlesnake in order to sustain themselves. I'm gonna quote from retired park ranger Dwight McCarter, who was involved in the search from the morning after Dennis went missing. He said, all of those people that's a lot of footprints, all those trucks. We searched and searched. Something should have been found, but you have to know what to look for. Get just a few of us trackers in first and give us a chance. Clearly, he and lots of other people were worried that such a large number of people, especially people who weren't really trained in searching, were just gonna be trampling over evidence, missing things. I mean, it was just an absolute disaster. But with that said, the obvious reason that so many people volunteered is because, well, it's a seven-year-old boy after all. It's a case that really just tugs at people's heartstrings. And so while I am obviously criticizing the search efforts, I do just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the heart and determination that all of the searchers displayed, even if at the end of the day, it might've kind of been, yeah, a total disaster. Despite over a thousand people searching and all the efforts, Dennis Martin was never located and 
hardly any evidence was ever found. It basically just seemed like he up and vanished, as though the Smoky Mountains had simply swallowed him whole. However, there was one potential clue discovered on day four of the search. Now, this clue didn't end up leading searchers to Dennis, but it did give us a glimpse into what might have happened to the missing boy. In the vicinity of Eagle Creek, which was roughly a mile away from where Dennis Martin was last seen, by the way, some hikers discovered suspicious looking footprints leading off of a trail. Intrigued, they followed the footprints as far as they could, some 300 yards before finally losing them at the edge of one of the many flooded streams in the area. Now, on first thought, these footprints could have belonged to anybody, right? Well, a closer examination provided evidence that the footprints might have actually belonged to Dennis. First of all, one of the prints was from a bare foot and the other print was from a shoe. This would be consistent with a lost, desperate boy roaming around in the woods. Second of all, the prints were found at a confusing junction with a water break, which looks very much like a trail and could easily confuse a child into following it. And lastly, both prints were small. You could even describe them as child-sized. A cast was made of the prints, but the Martin family felt as though the prints were too big for Dennis's feet. And it didn't take long for an explanation about these prints to emerge. The tracks were supposedly left by Boy Scouts, which would explain the small feet size. And besides, the Green Berets confirmed that they had already searched this area and they insisted that they would have found Dennis if he was nearby. But still, it's kind of hard to look back today and completely discount this evidence like they did at the time. I mean, first of all, the footprints were that of one single child, not an entire Boy Scout troop. So that explanation really doesn't make sense. And also there's no way that the Boy Scouts would have been searching without shoes on through this tough terrain. And so unfortunately, the only clue that resulted from this massive search was never properly followed up on and we'll really never know how much validity it had. There were a few more clues into the disappearance of Dennis Martin, but these clues all came in after the official search had already been suspended. More than a month after the disappearance, a man came forward and claimed that while visiting Cades Cove on Father's Day weekend, the same weekend that Dennis disappeared, he witnessed something suspicious. The man claimed that he was hiking off trail and was quoted saying, when we got about half a mile or maybe three quarters of a mile from the car, we heard a scream a troubling scream, an enormous, sickening scream. We couldn't tell which direction it came from, but it sounded like it came from higher on the mountain to me. I looked across the creek and saw a man in the bushes. I couldn't tell much about him because he was going down the creek towards the cars. He was definitely trying to keep from being seen. I thought maybe he was a moonshiner. And then this man that I was quoting allegedly found a homemade map located right where this creepy man that he had seen was standing. And he also noticed that this creepy man had likely driven off in an older model white Chevrolet. And so this story certainly sounded promising, but after investigating, officials ended up concluding that it was unrelated to Dennis Martin's disappearance. They believed that the man's location at the time was too far away from Spence Field for Dennis to have traveled there in the timeline presented. And thus, the second real lead in the case hit a dead end, and it would be years before the next lead would present itself. 16 years to be exact. In 1985, a man came forward and reported that he had discovered the remains of a small child in the area of Big Hollow near Tremont, Tennessee, deep inside the national park. This discovery was supposedly made some three to four miles straight line from where Dennis Martin was last seen. The area was searched by up to 30 men, but 
nothing was ever found. The man who made this report said that he had actually found the body a number of years earlier, but he neglected to tell officials because he was illegally hunting ginseng at the time. So he was afraid that he would end up getting arrested for that if he reported this thing that was completely unrelated. It's really, really frustrating. And thus, this lead would also prove to be a dead end and the last major lead that I'm aware of. Despite the biggest search in Great Smoky Mountains National Park's history, which still holds true to this day, by the way, one of the biggest searches in National Park history, period, 54 years have passed, 54, and we still don't know what happened to Dennis Martin. It's reported that some family members believe he was kidnapped, and this would certainly line up with the story about the suspicious man in the woods, but the fact is, zero evidence of this exists. Hell, we don't even have a suspect's name. Now, it's also possible that Dennis was the unfortunate victim of one of the thousands of black bears in the Smoky Mountains, or maybe he was bitten by a rattlesnake, or a copperhead, or a cottonmouth, or, in the most likely scenario, Dennis just got lost in the woods and couldn't find his way back due to the storm that night and just ended up dying due to exposure. This is the theory that lead investigators believe to be the most likely, but in my opinion, we're probably never gonna know exactly what happened. We do know, however, that a search will never be handled in the same unorganized manner ever again. The search for Dennis Martin has been analyzed and critiqued for decades, and it actually serves as a case study on what not to do. The National Park Service completely revamped its search and rescue plans after this, and never again will such a large influx of untrained and unorganized volunteers be allowed to just trample through an active search zone. The search for Dennis Martin cost $70,000 at the time, over half a million dollars in today's money, and Bill Martin, Dennis's father, died in 2014 without any closure on his son's disappearance. Today, Spence Field has been taken over by tree growth and it hardly resembles a field anymore. It hardly resembles the site that was once the location for one of the most mysterious disappearances in National Park history. My heart goes out to Dennis Martin, Bill Martin, and the rest of the Martin family. And though this case is sad, the silver lining is that it directly resulted in improved search procedures throughout the world and has likely saved many, many lives. I wanted to leave you with that positive perspective at the end of this video. Thank you for watching everybody. In May of 1996, Julie Williams and Lolly Winnens headed down to Virginia's Shenandoah National Park to go backpacking on the Appalachian Trail and the surrounding trails in the wilderness. I'm sure that the start of their trip was quite peaceful. Shenandoah is beautiful, and since both women were from up north, it's no surprise they chose this park as the place for their late spring hike. But as peaceful as things may have started, the end was anything but. After not hearing from his daughter, Julie Williams' father contacted the authorities and reported the woman missing. He knew they were in the park, somewhere. And he was right, because only a day later, the searchers, the woman's friends and families, they all had their worst fears confirmed as true. In a wooded campsite, only a half mile away from their parked vehicle, investigators discovered the scene of what would go on to be one of, if not the most, horrific crimes in National Park history. And to make matters even worse, almost 30 years later, we still don't know who was responsible. This is the tragic story of Julie Williams and Lolly Winnens. So I'm not gonna lie to you guys, this story is f***ed. There's nothing redeeming about it. There's no happy ending. It's it's a tough one. All right, let's do it. On Sunday, May 19th, 1996, partners Julie Williams and Lolly Winnens and their dogs set out for Shenandoah National Park in Western Virginia to do some backpacking. The trip was a celebration of a new job that 24-year-old Julie had recently secured in the Burlington, Vermont area. She was originally from Minnesota, but at the time was living in Richmond, Vermont, which is kind of crazy to me on a personal note because that's literally one town over from where I grew up in Jericho, Vermont. I would have been less 
than five months old at the time when this occurred. 26 year old Michigan native Lolly Winnens was described as a quote, micro drinking, fish following, cigarette smoking, good time girl. She too had spent some time in Vermont during college and then had actually ended up transferring to Unity College in Maine. The couple met each other at Woods Woman in Minnesota, which was a nonprofit organization focusing on education and adventure travel for women. Both women were drawn together due to their love of the outdoors and the wilderness and eventually started a romantic relationship. On the first day of their adventure, Julie and Lolly entered Shenandoah National Park and stopped at Pinnacle's Overlook on Skyline Drive. Skyline Drive is a scenic road that runs the entire length of the park for 105 miles and features numerous trailheads, vistas, campgrounds, and resorts. We know that Julie and Lolly stopped at Pinnacle's Overlook because they were actually carrying a camera at the time. This camera was later recovered by investigators and its photos have allowed them and now us to retrace their adventure in somewhat broad steps. After stopping at the Overlook, the woman set out along the White Oak Canyon Trail for a few days and eventually hitched a ride off the trail with a park ranger to escape some rainy weather and to renew their camping permits. But it wasn't long before the couple set out again, this time climbing Hawksbill, which is the highest peak in Shenandoah, before eventually making their way to camp for the night. They chose a spot near a stream that was just off the Bridal Trail, about a quarter mile away from Skyline Drive, and a half mile from where their car was parked at Skyland Lodge. This spot was also very close in proximity to the Appalachian Trail. Unfortunately, this would prove to be the end of the hike for the two women. It was now May 24th, and after this day, the two of them would never be seen alive again. Julie Williams' father was expecting to hear from his daughter after she had returned from the hike, and when he didn't hear from her by May 31st, he was getting very concerned. Concerned enough that on this day, he actually contacted the authorities, and they quickly started searching the park for any sign of the two women. It didn't take long before searchers found their first clue. They discovered the woman's car parked just north of Skyland Lodge off of Sky Skyline Drive. Deputy Chief Ranger Bridget Bonnet was quoted saying, we started doing hasty searches to cover all those trail corridors in that general area to see if we could locate them. At some point during those hasty searches, we did locate the dog. That's right. The second clue into what happened came when the searchers found the two women's golden retriever wandering through the park with no leash and no owners in sight. And so of course they continued searching and the next day they made a gruesome discovery. On June 1st, 1996, rangers discovered the lifeless bodies of Julie Williams and Lolly Winnens at their campsite. According to reports, it was a very violent scene. I'm not gonna describe it on here in detail, it's just, it's, it's too much. All I'm gonna say is that Lolly's body was found inside the tent and Julie's body was found down an embankment about 30 feet away from the campsite. It was an absolutely horrific discovery and obviously it launched the investigation into what had happened and who had carried out such a violent attack against the two hikers. It's likely that the two women were murdered just before or during Memorial Day weekend in 1996, which would have been a very popular time for tourists and other hikers to be visiting the park. So this, along with the fact that they were camped so close to the popular Skyland Lodge, begs the question, how did nobody discover the scene until days later when they were actively searching for the women? If somebody had discovered what had happened earlier, it's possible that they could have gotten a jump start on the investigation and maybe even have been able to stop the perpetrator before they left the park. Deputy Chief Ranger Bridget Bonet actually had an answer to this question. When talking about the campsite, she was quoted saying, it wasn't a heavily used or heavily traveled trail. They were following the backcountry regulations at the time, which required them to be out of sight. Now beyond this, I'm not exactly sure what the regulations were at the time, but it does appear to me at least that they've changed a little bit since the 90s. The website for Shenandoah National Park now says it is strongly recommended that you camp at pre-existing campsites. These campsites have been created and established by prior visitor use and are not posted, signed, 
or designated by the park. Having hiked through this area myself when I hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018, I also know that at least along the AT, maybe along other trails too, I'm not sure, there are like official designated shelters and campsites as well. These rules do seem a little bit different than they were according to this Deputy Chief Ranger's quote, which basically implied that backpackers were supposed to just go off the trail and kind of be out of sight. So this is a little bit of a side note, but given such a violent crime occurred in like a very heavily trafficked national park, it's reasonable to think that the public may have been at risk. I would assume at least that the authorities would want to spread the word quickly, not only to help generate leads for the investigation, but also to just warn people in the interest of public safety. But that's not what happened. Bizarrely enough, the National Park Service waited a full 36 hours before announcing to the public that the murders had occurred. They told everybody that it was a quote, isolated incident and that the murders appear to be random. Now, I'm sure they had their reasons for waiting so long to tell the public about this, but I don't know, it just seems weird to me that they waited so long, perhaps even a little bit negligent. But nonetheless, this is what happened, and at this point, the investigation was on. Someone needed to be brought to justice for committing such a heinous crime, but in 1996, over 1.5 million people visited Shenandoah National Park, so it would be hard to find a suspect. Since the murders took place on federal land that left the federal government in charge of working the case. The National Park Service teamed up with the FBI, although they did receive some help from the Virginia State Police's crime scene unit as well. And despite generating thousands of leads, no suspect emerged for over a year after the crime occurred. However, in the summer of 1997, all that changed. On July 9th, 1997, a female Canadian tourist was cycling on Skyline Drive when she was suddenly forced off the road by a man driving a truck. He began screaming sexual profanities at her and actually tried to force her inside the truck. Now, fortunately, the woman was actually able to fight the man off and break free. And at this point, he tried to run her over multiple times with his truck before eventually giving up and speeding off. He didn't get very far and he was actually arrested as he was trying to leave the park at Swift Run Gap. And as if that wasn't scary enough, when investigators searched the man's car, they found hand restraints and leg restraints. So just like super, super scary stuff. The man was identified as Daryl David Rice, and he was a resident of Columbia, Maryland at the time. And surprisingly, he actually had no criminal record at the time, although he was recently fired from a job about a month earlier for being, quote, extremely hostile at work. It was during the interviews investigators conducted with Rice trying to figure out what the hell had happened that they became suspicious that he may have been involved with the murder of Julie Williams and Lolly Winnens. Prosecution documents stated, quote, Rice became a possible suspect for a variety of reasons, including the obvious parallels in geographic location, the predatory behavior exhibited, and the exclusive selection of female victims. There was also another pretty damning piece of evidence that may have pointed at Rice saying that he was responsible for the murder of the two hikers a year prior. Authorities recovered videos of him entering Shenandoah National Park on May 25th and May 26th, 1996, which was right around the time that Julie and Lolly would have been murdered. Rice denied entering the park on these days, but he did admit to entering the park on June 1st, 1996, which was the same day that the two women's bodies were recovered. Rice eventually pled guilty to the attempted abduction of the Canadian tourist, and a few years later, in April of 2001, he was indicted for the murders of Julie Williams and Lolly Winnens. Now, at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that these two women were a couple and prosecutors actually believed that Rice had targeted the women because of their sexual orientation. Some of his previous actions and statements had indicated that he basically hated gay people. And so it seemed like the case may have finally been solved, but unfortunately, despite Rice's statements, despite the videotape of him entering the park, and despite the indictment, Rice was was never convicted of the crime. In fact, his case never even went to trial. In 2003, a hair that was found at the crime scene was tested. Before this, the only DNA evidence that prosecutors had was mitochondrial DNA that proved the killer's sex was male. When they tested this piece of hair, the DNA profile did not match that of Daryl David Rice. And given the rest of their case was largely circumstantial, the charges were dismissed without prejudice, leaving open the possibility that Rice 
price could potentially be charged at a later date if more evidence was found. But that never happened. Rice did his time for the attempted abduction and was eventually released from prison in 2011. He was actually a suspect in another murder, one that had nothing to do with Shenandoah or the Appalachian Trail, but he was never charged in that case either. As far as I'm aware, he hasn't been heard from in quite a long time. There was actually another suspect in the murders, Richard Ivonitz, who died in 2002 and was connected to multiple other murders, though he was never named as more than a suspect in the Shenandoah murders. I, I don't think they ever really found solid evidence to connect him to it. And so that brings us to today. The investigation is still open and I'm hoping that since DNA technology has progressed immensely since the early 2000s and also since investigators apparently do have some DNA from the crime scene, that the families of Julie and Lolly will someday, hopefully soon, get some answers. But until then, here we are nearly 30 years later, and we still don't know who committed one of the most horrific crimes in National Park history. If you have any information about this case, please contact the FBI's Richmond, Virginia division. And of course, keep Julie Williams, Lolly Winnens, and both of their families in your heart. In December of 1946, Paula Jean Weldon decided to end her day by going for a little hike on the Vermont Long Trail near Glastonbury Mountain. Shortly after she started, she passed a group of hikers going the opposite direction, and then she vanished. Forever. And as disturbing as that sounds, it gets even more disturbing because her disappearance was only one of five that occurred near Glastonbury Mountain from 1945 to 1950. This area has since been given an eerie name, the Bennington Triangle. And one of the most famous footpaths in the world runs directly through it. Every single year, thousands of AT through hikers venture right into the heart of this mysterious area, and a lot of them don't even know it. This is the story of Paula Jean Weldon and the Bennington Triangle. During the afternoon on Sunday, December 1st, 1946, college student Paula Jean Weldon told her roommate that she was going for a hike. Weldon was a student at Bennington College in Southern Vermont. It was 50 degrees Fahrenheit outside that afternoon, and as someone from Vermont, I grew up there, I can tell you that 50 degrees in December is much warmer than usual for that time of year. It's due to these temperatures, perhaps, that Weldon was not dressed appropriately for the cold temperatures that the Vermont mountains can experience in December. She was wearing a red parka jacket with a trimmed fur hood, blue jeans, and sneakers. And while this clothing was perfectly adequate for the temperatures in town that day, it was definitely not warm enough for the colder temperatures that were soon coming to the mountains over the next few hours. Around 2.45 p.m., passing motorist Lewis Knapp saw her hitchhiking on Vermont Route 67A and decided to give her a ride. He dropped her off on Route 9, a near three miles away from the Long Trail, which was her intended destination. The Long Trail runs the entire length of Vermont from Massachusetts to Canada, and Route 9 is the last road crossing before the trail begins to climb to the summit of Glastonbury Mountain. Today, the Long Trail and the Appalachian Trail coincide through Southern Vermont, which includes this section. They are the exact same trail in this area. The Appalachian Trail did exist back in 1946, but after doing some research, it's unclear to me whether or not the two trails followed the same route back at the time. Paula Jean Weldon made her way to the trail and she started hiking. It's really unclear what her plan was, and honestly, it kind of seems like she didn't really have one. I say this because around 4 p.m., she passed a man named Ernest Whitman and a few of his friends, and she asked him for directions and about how long the trail was. Whitman answered her questions, but he also cautioned her against hiking very far into the woods because, once again, she wasn't wearing adequate clothing for the weather that they were about to experience and also because it was 4 p.m. and nighttime was fast approaching. Again, I am from Vermont, I'm a native Vermonter, and I can tell you that in early December, it gets dark real quick. By 4 p.m., it would have already been starting to get dark, and by 5 p.m., it would have been solidly nighttime. Unfortunately, Paula Jean Weldon did not heed Whitman's warning, and she hiked into the woods. And this was the last time that Paula Jean Weldon was ever confirmed to have been seen 
dead or alive. There were a few other reported sightings of her along this part of the trail, but none of them were discovered to be credible. Her interaction with Ernest Whitman took place near Bickford Hollow, which ironically enough is an area that I hiked directly through back in 2021. I knew about Weldon's story at the time, but I didn't know about the significance of the spot I was standing right when I took this video. This spot is now known as Harbor Road and the present day Long Trail slash Appalachian Trail route is a few miles to the east of here. However, my understanding is that back in 1946, Harbor Road was the official Long Trail route. Paula Jean Weldon continued north on the Long Trail. She wasn't carrying a backpack and she didn't have any extra clothing. That night and into the next morning, the temperatures dropped, the wind picked up, and it even started to snow. And by the morning of December 2nd, Weldon's roommate started to get concerned because she hadn't returned yet. Her roommate contacted the administrators at Bennington College, they contacted the authorities and Weldon's family, and the search was on. They started by searching the college campus, but quickly turned their attention to the long trail after Ernest Whitman, the last man that Weldon had spoken to, recognized her photograph in the paper. The search for Paula Jean Weldon was massive. Over 125 people from the colleges in the area volunteered, and 120 men from the National Guard were brought in to help search as well. They also used planes, and they ultimately searched all of the long trail up to the summit of Glastonbury Mountain, and another trail in the area that goes over Bald Mountain, and also along Route 9 from Bennington to Brattleboro. Despite all of this searching, Weldon was never found, and neither was any trace of her. And by December 15th, they made the frustrating decision to call off the search. And to this day, there's still no answers about what happened to Paula Jean Weldon. There's no evidence, there's no suspects, there's nothing. Time went by, a lot of time, and eventually it became clear that she had become the second victim of the Bennington Triangle. You heard that right. She was the second victim. The first victim of the Bennington Triangle was a 74-year-old hunter named Mitty Rivers. Now, before I get into these next four disappearances, I just wanna say it was a lot harder to find accurate information about these cases than it was about Weldon's case. I found a lot of conflicting reports. It seems like some of the information is more just like local tales that have been passed down. And so definitely take these next four stories with a grain of salt. In November of 1945, less than a year before Weldon disappeared, Mitty Rivers was leading a hunting party in the southwest woods of Glastonbury Mountain. This area is very close to the Long Trail. The group was heading back to camp and Rivers ended up getting a little bit ahead of everybody else. And this didn't concern any of the other hunters because Rivers was a very experienced outdoorsman. However, he never returned to camp that night and he was ultimately reported missing. 300 volunteers and U.S. Army soldiers searched the area extensively for over a week, and the only thing they found was a discarded rifle cartridge of the same type that Mitty Rivers used. No other trace of him was ever found. Flash forward to December 1st, 1949, exactly three years to the date that Paula Jean Weldon went missing, and the Bennington Triangle claimed its third victim. This time it was a man named James Tedford, and out of all these disappearances, this one definitely makes the least amount of sense. Tedford was taking a bus from St. Albans in Northern Vermont back down to Bennington. According to witnesses, Tedford was on the bus all the way down through the last stop the bus made before arriving in Bennington. However, when the bus finally did stop at its final destination, Tedford was gone. His belongings were still on the bus and nobody saw him leave. And honestly, that's pretty much all there is to this story. Nobody ever heard from him again. We don't know what happened. I guess we just have to chalk it up to the Bennington Triangle. In October of 1950, the Bennington Triangle claimed its fourth and fifth victims. The first was eight-year-old Paul Jepson, and he was playing in his mother's pickup truck when she left him unattended for a little while. It was unclear to me how long. Some reports said just a few moments. Some reports said like an hour. But either way, when his mother returned to her pickup truck, 
Paul was gone. According to the boy's father, Paul had been talking about visiting the mountains for several days, presumably the ones surrounding Glastonbury Mountain because that was very close to where they lived. And once again, that's pretty much all we know about this case. I will say that there is a local legend that, quote, bloodhounds tracked his scent down to the same highway that Paula Jean Weldon disappeared nearby a few years earlier. I wasn't able to find any information that confirmed that. However, I did find an old newspaper clipping that says the dogs followed his scent to the junction of East and Chapel Roads, which as you can see here, is right on the edge of the vast Glastonbury wilderness. And just 16 days after Paul Jepson went missing, the Bennington Triangle claimed its fifth and final victim. This was 53-year-old Frida Langer, who was camping at the Somerset Reservoir, which is very close to Glastonbury Mountain. The only things between the reservoir and the mountain summit are a few remote dirt roads and about six miles of wilderness. Langer and her cousin had left their campsite to go for a hike, but Shortly after they left, she accidentally slipped and fell into a stream. She told her cousin that she was just gonna quickly go back to the campsite to change her clothes, but she never caught back up. And when her cousin went back to the campsite, there was no sign of her there either. A massive search of 400 people was conducted, but they never found her until seven months later in May of 1951. Langer's case is unique because out of the five disappearances inside the Bennington Triangle, her body was the only one to ever be recovered. On May 12, 1951, Langer's body was discovered near the eastern branch of the Deerfield River on the east side of Glastonbury Mountain. No cause of death was ever determined, unfortunately, because of the condition that they found her remains in. So why do they call it the Bennington triangle. I mean, obviously it's a play on the Bermuda Triangle, and obviously all these people went missing near Bennington and Glastonbury Mountain, but does the triangle part of this really play a relevant part in the story? Well, allow me to explain. James Tedford and Paul Jepson disappeared near the town of Bennington, Vermont, right here. Frida Langer disappeared near the Somerset Reservoir, which is right over here. And finally, Paula Jean Weldon and Mitty Rivers disappeared near the Long Trail, which runs up Glastonbury Mountain. And when we connect the dots here, you see this is how we get the triangle. And what's even more startling is that if you pay close attention, you might notice that the Appalachian Trail, which is this white line right here, runs directly through the heart of the triangle. Now I promise I'm not trying to scare you off from hiking the Appalachian Trail. Clearly none of these disappearances had anything to do with Appalachian Trail hikers. I mean, none of them even occurred on the Appalachian Trail as far as I'm aware, although two did occur very close to or directly on the Long Trail. I just wanna make more hikers aware of this story and make the connection between the Bennington Triangle and the Appalachian Trail because I've rarely ever seen anybody do so, which is really odd because once again, the trail runs right through the center of the triangle. If you're hiking Glastonbury Mountain in the future, I guarantee you'll be just fine. There's really nothing to worry about, but I think we can all admit that it is kind of creepy how this triangle exists and the AT goes right through it. For what it's worth, I guess, if you are hiking through that area, and especially if you're wandering off the trail to use the bathroom or something like that, I don't know, just keep an eye out. You never know what piece of evidence could be lurking out there just a little bit off of the trail. In May of 2008, Scott Johnson and Sean Farmer went for a fishing and camping trip in Dismal Creek, Virginia, just off of the Appalachian Trail. They were regulars at this spot and probably didn't think that this trip would be any different than all the ones before. However, they would soon realize that this would not be the case. They befriended a man named Ricky Williams, who ended up joining them at their campsite for dinner. Everything seemed to be going fine, but then all of a sudden, this man opened fire on both of them. And eventually the two men would learn that their attempted killer was not actually named Ricky Williams, but rather he was Randall Lee Smith. And this was not his first time attempting to kill along the Appalachian Trail. This is the story of the most dangerous man in Appalachian Trail history.
Randall Lee Smith spent almost his entire life in the town of Parisburg, Virginia, which is right along the Appalachian Trail. Most towns along the Appalachian Trail are far enough away from the trail that you have to get a ride into town, hitchhike, something like that. But Parisburg is kind of an exception. It's so close to where the trail crosses through there that you can actually walk right from the trail into the center of town. And I actually did this in 2018 when I hiked the Appalachian Trail. Randall Lee Smith grew up with the Appalachian Trail essentially being right in his backyard. There isn't too much known about Smith's upbringing, but we do know two things with certainty. The first thing is that Smith was a habitual liar, and he even got the nickname Lion Randall. And the second thing is that not only did Randall Lee Smith just happen to live near the Appalachian Trail, but he spent a lot of time just wandering around on it in the areas near his hometown. He would eventually go on to become very well known within the Appalachian Trail community, and for all the wrong reasons. In the spring of 1981, a social worker from Maine named Robert Mountford Jr. decided to take on a thru-hike of the AT. By the time he got to Virginia, he was joined by his friend Susan Ramsey, who was planning on hiking with him for a few weeks. The pair had told another hiker that they were gonna meet her in Parisburg, Virginia, but that date rolled around and Mountford and Ramsey never showed up. Eventually, the authorities were contacted and they began searching along the Appalachian Trail. Investigators went to a store along the AT called Trent's and they were asking if anyone had seen the two missing hikers. And as it turns out, they actually had been spotted there on May 19th, 1981, which would end up being one of their last known sightings. The investigators also received some reports that Mountford and Ramsey had been seen near a particular shelter along the Appalachian Trail and they were accompanied by an unknown man who had been acting eerie. This shelter was the Wapiti Shelter. 11 days after the last sighting of Mountford and Ramsey, investigators zeroed in on Wapiti Shelter. At first glance, everything at the shelter looked normal, but once a closer look was taken, blood was noticed between the floorboards of the shelter. That was not a good sign, and so with this in mind, investigators started searching the area, the woods surrounding the shelter, and it wasn't long before they discovered a very unnatural looking mound of leaves on the ground. It looked like like something had been intentionally buried there. It looked like someone had been digging and tried to cover something up. The investigators then began digging and they quickly discovered a buried cloth sleeping bag and inside of it was the body of Susan Ramsey. The investigation continued the next day and it didn't take long before search dogs discovered the area where Robert Mountford Jr. was also buried, again, also in his sleeping bag. An autopsy later revealed that he had been shot. Susan Ramsey had not been shot, however. She met her very, very tragic end due to stab wounds, and they also found defensive marks on her hands indicating that she fought her attacker Hard. As investigators searched the scene for more clues, they eventually discovered Ramsey's discarded backpack. And inside her backpack, they found a paperback book. And this would prove to be a huge break in the case. The book contained some bloody fingerprints and one of the fingerprints belonged to the killer. The fingerprint was traced to Randall Lee Smith, who had prints on file from his time working in the Norfolk, Virginia shipyards. And upon searching his home, investigators discovered several items that belonged to the two Two murdered hikers, including a bloody pair of jeans. At this point, they still hadn't apprehended Randall Lee Smith, but they did eventually track him down all the way in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where he was arrested. Smith refused to talk to investigators about what had happened, and eventually a date for his trial was set. However, the night before his trial was set to begin, the prosecutor accepted a plea bargain from Randall Lee Smith's attorneys. Smith pled guilty to two counts of second degree murder and was sentenced to, are you ready for it? 30 years in prison. Now 30 years is a lot obviously, but if I could just interject my opinion a little bit here, I think it's absolutely crazy that someone gets anything less than life in prison without the possibility of parole for a double homicide. That's that's crazy to me. And I'm not the only one that feels this way because at the time, back when this plea bargain was made public, a bunch of people went and actually protested at the courthouse, including a lot of hikers. And one of these hikers was Warren Doyle Jr., who's a very well-known person within the Appalachian Trail community, and he's actually hiked the Appalachian Trail 18 times. Now, as for the reasons that Smith got such a light sentence for such a heinous crime, it's really not super clear. I did find some reports that said the prosecutor 
prosecutor at the time was worried about the case being strong because they never really discovered a motive for the crime. And therefore, I guess they just felt like they had to take this plea deal because it was too risky to go to trial, but I don't know. While in prison, Randall Lee Smith was reportedly a model inmate. He caused no issues and he was released on parole in 1996 having served only half of his sentence. Again, is charged with second degree murder, a double homicide, and he gets out of prison in 15 years. At the time of Smith's release, Warren Doyle Jr. was quoted in the Roanoke Times saying, if another incident happens with Randall Smith, perhaps the people who are responsible for the plea bargain should be put on trial. And I think that quote is a very, very chilling foreshadow of what was to come next. After being paroled in 1996, Smith returned to his home in Parisburg, Virginia, and he kept a pretty low profile. However, he did continue to live up to his nickname, Lion Randall, because one of his neighbors was quoted saying, he, referring to Smith, said that he now had a girlfriend in Daytona Beach. He said he went down there to see her. It was a lie. Also, he said that he had a house in Daytona Beach and one in Las Vegas. Obviously, a bunch of nonsense for a man who just spent the last 15 years in prison and is currently on parole role with an ankle monitor. Overall, for the next 12 years, Randall Lee Smith stayed out of trouble, and it seemed like finally people's fears about him committing another violent act on the AT were starting to be put to rest. That all changed in May of 2008. Scott Johnston and Sean Farmer went on a fishing and camping trip in Dismal Creek, Virginia. This area is very close to the Appalachian Trail. As you can see here, it's just mere feet away from where the trail runs through in many spots. While the two men were fishing, they actually encountered another man named Ricky Williams and his dog. This Ricky Williams character was described as being sort of straggly looking and the men also believed that he might have been an alcoholic. But despite this unsettling appearance, Johnston and Farmer were good dudes and so they invited this Ricky Williams man back to their campsite to have dinner. And everything seemed to be going okay, but then as nighttime was starting to set in, Ricky Williams randomly stood up, called to his dog, and then started walking away from the camp Site. And then the actions that this man took would forever change the lives of Johnston and Farmer. Ricky Williams pulled out a 22 caliber pistol and shot Farmer. The attack came out of absolutely nowhere. Ricky Williams then turned the gun on Johnston and shot him twice as he attempted to flee into some nearby brush to take some cover. Eventually Johnston stopped to catch his breath and when he turned around, he saw the man shoot his friend Farmer again. Farmer desperately started running towards his Jeep and somehow managed to take off and drive away before Ricky Williams could get a hold of him. Johnston took off down the road and eventually he was actually in intercepted by Farmer who had fled in the opposite direction. Johnston stopped the Jeep and Farmer quickly hopped in and they kept going down the road. Now keep in mind, they're in the middle of the woods. This is a very remote road and they are miles and miles away from any sort of civilization. And they were also in critical condition. They had both just been shot and Farmer actually began to lose sight in one of his eyes. So Johnston took over the steering and Farmer remained operating the gas and brake pedals. Miraculously, they managed to make it down the road, and when they saw a house on the side of the street, they went and pleaded with the homeowner to help them and to call the police. The police and paramedics did eventually arrive, and the two men were flown to the nearest hospital in critical condition. And thankfully, by some sort of miracle, both men survived the attack. And the next day when the police interviewed Sean Farmer, he was told that the man who attacked him was not actually named Ricky Williams, but rather he was Randall Lee Smith. And this man had attempted and unfortunately succeeded to kill along the Appalachian Trail in the past. In fact, the location of Smith's 1981 murders were less than two miles away from the location of his 2008 attacks. And it turns out that after Johnston and Smith had made their escape in the Jeep, Smith then fled police by stealing Johnston's truck. And during the pursuit, he actually crashed the truck and he crashed it hard. He crashed it so hard that police thought it might've actually been an attempted suicide. But it wasn't and Smith was captured and taken into custody and then four days later he died. Finally 
the most dangerous man in Appalachian Trail history was no longer a threat. When police searched the area of Smith's 2008 attack, they found a cache containing an assortment of very random and creepy items. They found his GED and birth certificates, a police scanner, and they even found a map of the area with several places marked with X's on it. And so of course they searched those areas, fearing the worst, but they never found anything in those locations that was suspicious. In this cache, they also found a cassette tape that contained, quote, some kind of satanic ritual. They found eight pairs of women's underwear and over 30 knives. So unfortunately, violent attacks like this do occur on the Appalachian Trail, but I would be remiss if I didn't make it crystal clear that these sorts of attacks are very, very, very rare. Every single year, millions of people set foot on the Appalachian Trail with no incidences, no violence, nothing happening. I hiked the entire Appalachian Trail in 2018 and I didn't have any problems. And this is the case for the vast, vast, vast majority of people. These stories are real, they are scary, and I just hope that it serves as a reminder to you to just be alert and aware and keep your wits about you when you're hiking. And I also wanna remind you that you are infinitely more likely to have a violent, dangerous encounter walking down the street in pretty much any city in the world than when you are walking on the Appalachian Trail. In July of 2018, two people set off to hike through the Big Cypress National Preserve in Southern Florida. The heat must have been unbearable in the middle of the summer, so it's no surprise that about 10 miles into their hike, they stopped at the Noble Campsite to take a break. When they got to this campsite, they noticed that a yellow tent was set up and there was a pair of boots sitting out beside it. And something must have fell off to the hikers because rather than assuming it was just another hiker taking a rest, they felt the need to look inside the tent and see what was going on. And as it would turn out, there were no signs of life inside that tent. And I say that because what they found when they pulled aside the yellow tent cover was the lifeless body of a hiker staring directly at them. It turns out that these two hikers had just made a discovery that would launch a mystery that would perplex the hiking community, the media, as well as the authorities for years. And that's because nobody knew who this man was, nobody. All they knew was his trail name, which was mostly harmless. And even after this man was truly identified some years later, no cause of death was given. And that's very frightening because even to this day, nobody knows how or why he died. This is the story of Mostly Harmless. I really think that this is probably the strangest death in the history of backpacking and through hiking. It's a story that spans multiple years and a huge portion of the country, but it all starts on the Appalachian Trail in New York State. In April of 2017, a man started hiking southbound on the AT just north of New York City. It wasn't long before he started going by the trail name Mostly Harmless, which he supposedly referred to himself as one night while sitting around a campfire. I'm not exactly sure where this name came from, but it's possible that it was a reference to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, going on a long distance hike like this is a pretty unique thing, at least for people who aren't huge hiking nerds like myself. And in addition to this, there's actually a few things that made Mostly Harmless even more unique, even in comparison to his fellow hikers. This man was not carrying a cell phone or a credit card or any type of identification, no technology whatsoever. Now, back in the day, this would have been completely normal, of course, but once again, I just wanna remind you, this was in 2017. Mostly Harmless had told other hikers that he had previously worked in the tech industry and he was trying to take a break from his digital life and it seemed like he was doing a pretty good job. Mostly Harmless made his way south along the Appalachian Trail, and it seems as though he made quite a few friends along the way. On occasion, he would appear in photos taken by other hikers. This one right here was taken in October of 2017 at the Woodchuck Hostel in Damascus, Virginia. And this photo stuck out to me because it would be less than a year later that I would stay at that very same hostel in 2018 on my Appalachian Trail through hike. In addition to these photos, Mostly Harmless even appeared in a GoPro video taken by one fellow hiker. He was described as a really nice person and also very strong on the trail. But despite all of these interactions that he was having, he never told anybody what his true 
real name was. In fact, when he had no other choice but to give a real person name, not just his trail name, like when he was signing in at a hotel, for instance, he would give the name Ben Billamy, which would later turn out to be an alias. By December 1st, 2017, Mostly Harmless walked into Mountain Crossings in Northern Georgia. Mountain Crossings is a store that's only about 30 miles away from the Southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. He told an employee at the store that he he was looking to find a route from the southern end of the Appalachian Trail all the way down to the Florida Keys, indicating that he was nowhere close to being finished hiking even after coming over a thousand miles on the AT. The employee sold him some maps, snapped a photo of him for the store's Facebook page, and Mostly Harmless, who also went by the trail name Denim sometimes, went on his way, continuing south, apparently down to Florida. As part of his route south, Mostly Harmless hopped onto the Pinhoti Trail, which is a 335 mile trail that runs through Northwestern Georgia and Alabama. He was photographed at least once while on the Pinhoti Trail and eventually either completed the trail or hopped off it at some point to continue on south to Florida. On January 24th, 2018, a woman named Kelly Fairbanks, who often helped hikers along the Florida Trail, met Mostly Harmless while he was in in the middle of a road walk on Highway 90. Later on, Fairbanks would describe Mostly Harmless as a nice man with kind eyes. However, Fairbanks was a trail angel for the Florida Trail, somebody who helps out through hikers, gives them food, places to stay, rides into and out of town, things like that. And so she had interacted with a lot of through hikers over the years. She knew what a prepared through hiker looked like and based on her interaction with Mostly Harmless, she felt like he was very unprepared for the trail. She found out that he was not carrying a cell phone or a GPS and was instead relying on a paper map for navigation, but the map wasn't very detailed. It lacked a lot of things that he would have needed to hike the trail. And she also noticed that he was making a number of quote, rookie mistakes when it came to some of his gear choices. This caused Fairbanks to specifically remember her encounter with Mostly Harmless and she even snapped this photo of him, which would later play a pretty significant role in his case. About a month later, two Florida trail hikers met Mostly Harmless on a flooded portion of the trail in the Osceola Wildlife Management Area. They remembered the encounter with him specifically because once again, he told them that he wasn't carrying a cell phone or a GPS and not even a detailed map, which prompted the two hikers to exchange trail information with Mostly Harmless, and they went into detail with him far more than they normally would to try and make things easier for him. About two days after this, a woman met Mostly Harmless at the Sand Pond Campground in Pine Log State Forest. During conversation, Mostly Harmless told this woman that he had previously worked in the tech field and strangely enough that he had some health issues and he wanted to do the trail before he wasn't physically able to. This was the only circumstance that I was able to find where he talked about having a potential health issue. On March 17th, Another hiker briefly interacted with Mostly Harmless, exchanging trail names and basic pleasantries near Paisley, Florida. And finally, on April 15th, 2018, trail angel Mike met Mostly Harmless on the side of the road a few miles north of Nobles Camp. He was most likely the last person to see Mostly Harmless alive. A couple months later, on July 23rd, 2018, two hikers headed into the Big Cypress National Preserve on the Florida Trail. They trudged through swamps, oppressive heat, and also through alligator territory, mind you, for 10 miles until they finally reached the nobles camp where they intended to take a break. And as it would turn out, this break would become a very memorable one and not for the right reasons. When they arrived to the campsite, they noticed a yellow tent that was set up with a pair of boots sitting just outside of it. And they also noticed a very bad smell. Something just felt very off to the pair about the whole situation. And so they called out to the person that was in the tent only to get no response. And at this point, they decided to peek inside the tent. And what they saw absolutely shook them right down to their cores. When they looked inside, they found the body of an extremely skinny man staring directly up at them. The two hikers called 911 and 
the investigation was on. Upon arriving at the scene, I'm sure one of the first things that investigators wanted to do was to identify the person inside the tent. They would have looked for a driver's license or ID, maybe a credit card with a name on it, or even a person's cell phone that could have some identifying information on it. At the very least, maybe there was a missing persons report from the area that they could match the person's description to. But unfortunately for the investigators, none of those things existed in this case. They couldn't even match the man's fingerprints or DNA in any existing databases. It was almost as though this man had zero connections to the outside world. And as perplexing as that was, it was equally as perplexing trying to figure out how the man had died. There was no signs of foul play at the campsite and the man weighed only 83 pounds when they found him, despite being five feet, eight inches tall. This would lead you to believe that perhaps the man had starved to death then because he was really skinny. 83 pounds for that height is extremely, extremely thin. Maybe he had gotten lost or physically incapacitated somehow and he just ran out of food. This theory seems reasonable, right? Indeed it does until you learn that along with the man's gear in his campsite, investigators found food. He had food left with him and he also had over $3,000 in cash. And in addition to that, the fact that he was found at an established campsite just makes me feel like it's really unlikely that he would have just starved to death without anybody noticing. It is true that there's not that many people that hike the Florida trail, especially in the summer like this, but I don't know. I just feel like the chances of somebody coming through to that campsite in the time period it would have taken him to starve to death were really, really high. I just feel like somebody would have found him before he died, but that's just me I don't know what happened and ultimately an autopsy was done and the man's death was ruled as undetermined investigators had no idea what had happened to this man and they knew they wouldn't get anywhere until they identified him the Florida Department of Law Enforcement started by creating a composite photo of the man based on the appearance of his body they also released images of his tent his hiking poles and his boots as well as an estimation that he was between 35 and 50 years of age. The composite photo of the man quickly began circulating on the internet, particularly in hiking groups. And it wasn't long before Kelly Fairbanks, the same woman who had stopped on Highway 90 some six months earlier to talk to this man, recognized his composite photo from a Facebook post. She contacted the police and also shared her photo of the man online. Very soon after, dozens of other people started to chime in saying that they too had met the man, maybe even had hiked with him or camped with him. They were able to come up with the first sign of identification for the man, and that was his trail name, Mostly Harmless. And many people had additional photos of him as well. I was able to find at least 11 unique photos of Mostly Harmless, which were quickly spread all over the internet as the story gained more and more attention. But despite all this attention, nobody was able to identify him beyond just his trail name. There were numerous Numerous images of his face, his gear, there were multiple people that had talked with him about his story on the trail. They even knew where he had started his hike and what his plans were. They knew what his past career was and even where he was from. But nobody knew his real name. Nobody. And despite all this information, the case went cold. For the rest of 2018 and all of 2019, no leads were found. In 2020, the police department decided to partner with Othram, which is a private DNA lab. They hoped that they could discover the deceased hiker's identity through forensic genealogy. Now, despite being a massive fan of the TV show Forensic Files, I really don't know much about this. So if anybody does, please leave a comment and enlighten me. All I know is that through this process, they were able to determine that the man's area of origin was likely Assumption Parish in Louisiana. And after this discovery, they started running targeted Facebook ads in that area with pictures of Mostly Harmless, hoping that somebody would recognize the photos. And sure enough, it worked. Just before the end of 2020, one of Mostly Harmless's former co-workers recognized the man in the photos, and she said that his name was Vance Rodriguez. Finally, years later, 
a real name existed for Mostly Harmless. The coworker was able to provide additional photos of Rodriguez, which were matched to the ones of him on the trail. Authorities were able to make contact with Rodriguez's family and through DNA testing by January of 2021, they were able to confirm with 100% certainty that the man discovered in the tent on the Florida trail was in fact Vance Rodriguez. And at this point, the case was declared solved by the media, but that doesn't seem right to me. Was it really solved? I mean, sure, the man's identity was finally found, that part of the case was solved, and certainly that was a big and confusing part of the story, but I think it's naive to label the entire case as solved because we still have a ton of unanswered questions about Rodriguez and what happened to him. The most notable one being, how and why did he die? Let's start by ruling some things out as best we can. The first being foul play. Investigators were very confident that he did not die as a result of foul play. Once again, he was found with over $3,000 cash on him, indicating that robbery certainly wasn't a factor. Next up, a drug overdose most likely was not the cause. The only two substances that they found inside his body were ibuprofen as well as an antihistamine, both of which were very common for hikers to take, and there was also no sign of excessive alcohol use. The most likely cause of death seemed to be starvation, because once again, he only weighed 83 pounds when they found his body. However, I'll also remind you that they found food in his campsite food that he could have eaten, food that he carried out there. And in addition to that, he was only about five miles away from a major highway where he could have hitchhiked or gotten a ride into town to get more food if he really needed it. None of this makes any sense. And to this day, we still don't know what happened. The only other possibility that I can think of would be that Rodriguez took his own life, but if this were the case, he would have intentionally starved himself first and then taken his own life in a way that the investigators couldn't uncover. To my knowledge, there is really no evidence that this is what happened. And the only thing that I found that even hints at there being some possibility of this is that it's known that when Rodriguez was about 15 years old, he did attempt to take his own life with a firearm, but he failed. So he did have a history with this, but that's not even close to enough evidence to determine conclusively that he took his own life all these years later. There's really just not any true evidence of that. And another question I have is, how the hell did it take two years for somebody to recognize Mostly Harmless as Vance Rodriguez. It wasn't like the man was avoiding human contact when he was on the trail and we didn't have any other photos of him besides the composite. That's just not the case. He made a number of friends. He interacted with dozens and dozens of people. And once again, he was photographed at least 11 different times. Before his true identity was discovered, his case was covered by tons of media outlets, major ones too, including the New York Post, Wired Magazine, and Fox News. So it's not like his his story was just flying under the radar. And also, why didn't anybody report him as missing? We actually do kind of have an answer for that question. It's reported that Rodriguez was estranged from his friends and family in Louisiana, so they wouldn't really have been looking for him. And also, a few of his ex-girlfriends had reported that he was abusive and they were afraid of him. It's a whole nother part of the story I'm not gonna get into, but there is some information out there about it if you wanna read more, it's not great. And so they wanted nothing to do with him, so they were also not looking for him. Overall, it just seems like he really didn't have contact at least regular contact with anybody back home or anybody in his personal life off the trail. This whole story is just so strange, so bizarre. I feel like in a lot of the hiking mysteries that I've been covering on the channel lately, there's always takeaways and mistakes made and lessons that can be learned by all of us. I'm always looking out for these when I cover these sad stories and I'm trying to do a better job of highlighting them in the videos. But to be honest with you, I'm really unsure of what the lessons are from this particular story. I mean, certainly if Rodriguez had carried a GPS or had told somebody where he was gonna be and what his plans are, he probably would have been saved. But it seemed like not having any contact with anybody back home and not carrying a GPS, a cell phone, or any technology was an important part of his journey on the trail. He probably knew the risk that he was taking on. I don't know, it's such a bizarre, sad, and scary story. So I want you guys to let me know what the lessons and takeaways are from this one. Leave a comment, let me know, and of course, 
Thank you all so much for watching. 21 years ago, something incredibly sinister and evil happened right here. On Monday, November 19th, 2001, Louise Chaput should have been returning home from a hike she took in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. But instead, on that very same day, she was reported missing by her boyfriend. This marked the start of a case that would go on to stump even the top investigators for the state of New Hampshire and haunt hikers throughout New England. The day after she was reported missing, police found her car in this very parking lot located less than a thousand feet away from the famous Pinkham Notch Visitor Center and the trailhead for popular trails up Mount Washington. But after this discovery, the case went cold, but it didn't remain cold for long. On Thanksgiving Day 2001, the body of Louise Chaput was located right here in these woods. Now, I don't know the exact location that her body was found at, but I do know that it was somewhere right around here, likely within eyesight of where I'm looking at right now. And I also know that whoever killed Chapu in these woods 21 years ago has never been brought to justice. Whoever committed this crime either died a free man some years ago or remains a free man to this day, still likely living in the area. This is the story of Louise Chapu and murder in the White Mountains. This is the Diretissima Trail in White Mountain National Forest. You'll understand why that's significant very shortly. So this story is kind of personal to me. I love the White Mountains. This is literally one of my favorite places in the entire world. I've hiked all over the region here and I've even spent some time living here over the past few years. It really does feel like a second home to me and I think of it as a very special and honestly peaceful place. But the story that I'm gonna to share today is anything but peaceful. 52 year old Louise Chapu is from Sherbrooke, Quebec, a medium sized city located about an hour and 45 minutes east of Montreal. Chapu was a mother of two daughters and she worked as a psychologist. She was known for being funny, adventurous, and selfless, often volunteering her counseling services to families who could not otherwise afford them. She was also an avid hiker. One of her friends was quoted saying, she adored nature and the outdoors. Leading up to November of 2001, Chapu and her friends were in the process of planning a group hike together. However, these plans ended up falling through and Chapu decided to just head out on her own instead. The location that she chose was the White Mountains of New Hampshire, an area that she was at least somewhat familiar with, having summited the infamous Mount Washington at least once in the past. On the morning of November 15th, 2001, Chapu packed up her hiking gear, said goodbye to her family, and left in her silver Ford Focus, heading towards Pinkham Notch at the base of Mount Washington. Chapu crossed from Canada into the United States at 11.45 a.m. at the Norton, Vermont border crossing, and eventually made her way to the small town of Colebrook, New Hampshire, where she made a purchase at a convenience store. And by 3 p.m., she finally made it to the White Mountains with about an hour and a half of daylight to spare. Now that might sound crazy to some of you, but those of us that live in the Northeast know that in November, it gets dark really, really early. Chapu obviously knew that too, but after sitting in the car for so many hours, it appears as though she wanted to get out and at least stretch her legs a little bit. And since she had finally arrived at her destination in the White Mountains, why not do that by going for a little hike? This choice seemed like a no-brainer, but because she didn't have much daylight left, Chapu knew that she wouldn't be summiting Mount Washington or any of the other tall peaks surrounding Pinkham Notch. Looking for guidance, Chapu walked into this building right here, the Pinkham Notch Visitor Center, and she asked an employee for a suggestion about a short hike that she could complete before dusk. The employee told her to check out the Lost Pond Trail, which was a short hike that was right across the street from the visitor center. This employee would turn out to be the last person besides Chapu's killer to ever see her alive. Louise Chapu had reservations to stay at the Joe Dodge Lodge located near the visitor center at Pinkham Notch that first night, 
but records indicate that she never checked in. She was only supposed to be in the White Mountains for the long weekend, and she was planning on returning to Sherbrooke in time for work on Monday, November 19th, 2001. Her coworkers must have been alarmed, however, because on that day, Shapu never showed up. Her boyfriend was also alarmed because it's on this day that he reported her missing. A search was started immediately and it didn't take long before investigators discovered their first clue suggesting that something had gone wrong. The day after Shapu was reported missing, this parking lot right here became the focus of the search. This is the trailhead for the Diratissima Trail and police found her silver Ford Focus sitting in one of these very parking spots. The Diratissima Trail isn't the only trail that can be accessed from here, however. Pinkham Notch and all of its trails are literally right up the street, and one of those trails includes the Lost Pond Trail, which is the trail that Shapu had been directed to from the visitor center employee. So now that her car had been discovered, obviously the next step was to look inside of it. A few items that Shapu was known to always carry with her when she went hiking were located inside the car, including her water, some chocolate, and her hiking shoes. This indicated that whenever she left her car there, she was not planning on being out for very long, which also matches up with the account told by the visitor center employee. Her keys were not inside the car and neither was one of her two backpacks, which was a large blue backpack with a Canadian flag on the outside. Investigators also were unable to locate her green down sleeping bag. After the discovery of her car, dozens of searchers from New Hampshire Fish and Game, Mountain Rescue Services, and the US Forest Service, among other groups, continued looking for Shapu or for any clues into what had happened. They struggled through intense wind, blowing snow, and temperatures that were well below freezing. Unfortunately, the first day of searching turned up no additional evidence besides the discovery of her car, and so on the second day, they stepped up their effort and brought in a helicopter from the US Army National Guard. This seemed like a promising move, but by the end of day two, they still had not been able to locate the missing Canadian hiker. Was Shapu injured, stranded somewhere in the mountains? Had she been a victim of foul play? Or had she simply up and left the region, leaving her car behind to start a new life? Investigators would get an answer to these questions on Thanksgiving Day 2001, the third day of the search for Louise Chapu. On the afternoon of Thursday, November 22nd, 2001, Louise Chapu's body was found right here, somewhere in this patch of woods I'm standing in right now. I'm not sure of the literal exact spot where it was located, like the exact patch of ground where they found it. I'm not even sure if I really want to know, but I do know that they found her body 100 to 200 yards south of the Glen Boulder trailhead and just a little bit off of New Hampshire Route 16. It was evident to investigators that Shapu had not taken a fall or succumbed to the elements, two things that very often lead to the death of hikers. It was apparent that she had been killed violently and that she put up a fight somewhere likely within eyesight of where I'm standing right now an intense struggle between innocence and evil took place. And unfortunately, evil won. After an autopsy, it was determined that Shapu had been stabbed to death. She was found wearing black fleece pants, a red nylon jacket, and Reebok sneakers, none of which is really considered hiking apparel, hiking clothing. And so this once again indicated that she was not planning on going for a long hike on the evening that she left her car. Notably absent from the scene were the items that were also noticed to be missing from her car. Her large blue backpack with the Canadian flag on it could not be located and neither could her car keys. After the visitor center employee had directed her to the Lost Pond Trail, it was assumed this was where Shapu would have hiked. And given her car was located very close to the Lost Pond Trail, this checked out as well. However, her body was not discovered on this trail. It appears that after Shapu parked, she instead decided to hike out on the Diratissima Trail, which links up with the Glen Boulder Trail after roughly a mile. She then must have hiked down towards the Glen Boulder Trailhead, also known as the Glen Ellis Falls Trailhead, before eventually being forced off the trail 
by her killer. After the search turned into a homicide investigation, investigators put forth a call to the public asking anyone who might have been in that area and noticed anything suspicious to please come forward with information. Now, late November is probably one of, if not the least popular time of year to visit the White Mountains. However, Pinkham Notch is still an incredibly popular spot. And since a full week had gone by between the time that Shapu was last seen and when her body was discovered, police hoped that enough people would have hiked through there that somebody must have noticed something. But unfortunately, no one ever came forward. Pinkham Notch is a very popular spot with tourists. I would even say probably, definitely, the majority of people who visit that area are from out of town. And so by the time the authorities put this call for help out, most people who might have been in the area at the time had already returned home. Many of them out of state, most of them probably never even hearing about the crime. The investigation soon went cold, and I hate to say it, but it's still cold even to this day. Nobody has been brought to justice for killing Louise Chapu. There is still hope for the case, however, which remains active to this day, by the way. First of all, her backpack with the Canadian flag on it and her car keys, among a few other items, were never recovered. Now, maybe these items were just buried or lost in the woods somewhere, but there's also a good chance that the killer took them for trophies or for some other reason. And therefore, there's a good chance that the killer still has these items to this day. And so if a suspect does emerge someday and investigators find these items in the possession of that suspect, that would be a huge break in the case. And there is one more big piece of evidence that could eventually help bring Chapu's killer to justice. DNA from the killer was recovered from the scene, which will hopefully someday be matched and point a clear finger at the person responsible. But until that happens, we really don't know much else. Authorities have stated that they believe the killing was random. It seems as though they've ruled out the possibility that it was somebody she knew. I mean, maybe that is possible, but authorities really do think that it was just a random killing. She was just at the wrong place at the wrong time, which is extremely scary because the area around the White Mountains is extremely safe and this kind of thing almost never happens. Authorities have also said that it's likely that her killer was a local living somewhere in the area. And if that's true, there's a good chance that this person still lives somewhere close to this spot, even to this day. If you have any information relating to this case, if you were in the area of the Glen Boulder Trail and Pinkham Notch back in the fall of 2001, please contact the New Hampshire Cold Case Unit using the information down below in the description. My heart goes out to Louise Chapu, her friends, and of course, her family. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching.